Hello, welcome to the March 1st, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. Uh, I'm going to do a quick audio test and we'll get started. Bear with me just a second. Hello, welcome to the March 1st, 2022. Okay, sounds like my monitoring computer. I'm going to do a quick audio test and we'll get started. Bear with me just a second. Hello, welcome to the March 1st, 2022. Okay, sounds like my monitoring computer. All right, so my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you could submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de, or you could just uh, simply ask the questions live in the chat field. Uh, we'll try to get through all the questions as quickly and as succinct uh, and as succinctly as possible. Um, and when asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase that you're using whether it's uh, Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, and which version number, whether it's 10, 10.5, or 11, uh, and which operating system that you're using, that information is helpful. Um, if you don't see an immediate response to your question, my ability to actually answer questions in a real-time manner uh, will soon be evaporated but I'll try my best to catch up and answer all the questions and those questions that were sent in advance. Um, but if we could try to, if you don't see an immediate response, if we could try to refrain from asking the same question repeatedly, that just kind of slows down the whole process for me. Uh, I would appreciate that. Um, and we should have all of the topics, uh, all of the topics for the live stream should be pinned, uh, to the top of the comments field with, with timestamps, uh, a few hours after the live stream, I'll take a dinner break and go back and rewatch all of the live stream again and and you know uh type in all of the various questions so uh, and then you could refer to that but if you wanted to look for questions that have been answered in previous live streams jan from stockholm has been kind enough to create a the website cubaseindex.com and you could search there for topics that may have been covered in pre other live streams i think we have done over you know, 16,000 questions or something. Uh, so there's a lot of great material there. So thanks to Jan for setting up that website. We have two people that serve as moderators that help me out. Uh, they're not Steinberg employees, uh, but they uh, volunteered their time to make it a better community. So we want to give a special thanks to Jazz Dude and Agent K. Uh, and also one other valuable resource of information. Uh, Jazz Dude spends a lot of time compiling different tutorials uh, in the Cubase Nation Discord. So check that out. And special kudos to Jazz Dude for uh, creating such a wonderful uh, resource of information for the community. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. Okay, so I just see a question. Uh, hi, I still love use and love Virtual Guitars too. Will there be a way to use it with the upcoming Cubase 12, do you know? So I, I don't think that there would be any changes if you're currently using it through, you know, Virtual Guitars has been discontinued uh, almost probably 17 years ago now. Um, but if you're currently running in Cubase 11, I wouldn't anticipate it having any problems running it in future versions. I haven't tried it in Cubase 12, but maybe after release, uh, we could, I could give it a try, but I don't think I have a current version because I, I tend not to use any 32 bit plugins anymore on my systems. But I would say that there, I don't, I wouldn't anticipate changes, but I haven't tried. So I think if it, you have it working now, that it would probably still kind of work the same way. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, hello, Greg. Thanks for doing these live streams. Can you explain how to tag samples in Cubase, meaning add tags, delete tags, etc.? I'm struggling with this. All right, so let's say if we want to, we could do this in the media bay. So if we wanted to go to media bay, and let's say if we just wanted to go to a computer, we could say, okay, I want to take this particular audio file. Um, and if we look in the media bay on the right-hand side, we'll have an entire... Uh, editor here where we could just, if we want it to uh, go to settings at this point, we could just see a number of different tags that we could add. So if you just say, okay, you know, we could have, you know, and if we wanted to kind of create our own tags at this point, we could, 
you know, have it be text, a number based, a yes, no kind of criteria, but you should be able to just as you want to, you know, say I want to come here to the tempo and just be able to kind of type in a value in the tempo field or okay, my signature, I want this to be in four, four. Uh, so you should be able to just kind of add your tags directly right there on the right hand zone of your media bay. So you could give that a shot and see if that will work for you. And if you need to add your own user tags, click on the little plus sign and then you could add all the user tags accordingly. Okay, so we have Tata Digital Studios uh, checking in from Finland, wishing everyone a happy new month. It's like, yeah, February went quickly. But yeah, I guess February usually does uh, compared to other months. But thank you. And we see Randy Lee from uh, from Texas. And you, if, if you are watching the live stream live, I'm actually presenting, I should have mentioned this, uh, from Alexandria, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. area. And uh, so if you're watching this live, please introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. All right. And we see John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. All right. And we have John Kay checking in from Sweden. And Jazz Dude, I believe, is in Germany. We have Benny from Sweden as well. All right. So we have Andy checking in from Michigan. Glad you can make the live stream. All right. All right, so we see Chris Tazi just asking, has it started? So, yep, we are starting. All right. Let me see Best Green Jesus. I believe he's in San Diego area in the United States, California. All right, and we have Jan from Stockholm checking in. We have Sir Robert from Atlanta, the famous Robert. And we have Chris Hallam checking in from Columbia, South Carolina. It's great to see you on the, you and Best Green Jesus as well, on the Zoom meetup on Friday. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is this is the live stream going to be relevant to previous versions of Cubase? I'm on 9.5 Pro for Windows. You know, if you have questions, I'm, I'm going to be doing everything in uh, Cubase 11, but there will be a lot of stuff that will be applicable to earlier versions, such as Cubase Pro 9.5. Uh, but I'm not going to, you know, if there may be some functions that will be introduced in version, you know, 10, 10.5, and 11. So, um, but a lot of it will be, um, you know, I think many people discover new tricks that have been in Cubase for, that has been features in Cubase for years. Uh, and, you know, so you, there's probably a lot of it that will be applicable. All right, we have Stefan checking in from Sweden, and we see Nick as well, and Rich from Florida. All right, and Stefan from Sweden. All right, so Chris Allen was just mentioning, Greg, you need an AI to assist with typing out all those questions. Bless you. So it just, it takes a while. Um, you know, I think the best results are just, I, w I wish there was a, an AI way or if, or if I had a secretary that could, or someone that could, uh, take notes during the live stream, but you know, it would just to make sure that it actually makes sense and rephrasing questions that are intelligible as I read them poorly. So, but it just takes a little time, but I think the effort is worth it for the users. All right, we see Robbie Bowling from Dallas. And periodically my chat field will jump on me like it just did. All right, we have Chris checking in from Jersey in the UK. All right, so we have a question from uh, John K. Just saying, uh, Greg, uh, Cubase Pro 11, how to layer more than four instruments from one MIDI track? As far as I know, it's only possible to layer four instruments in MIDI inserts. Uh, I want to have six instruments. Thank you. 
So if you wanted to do, you know, something like that, so let's say I have, um, I'll just move this part out of the way. You know, one, one way to do this, a lot of people miss, let's say I have an electric piano and I wanted to layer that. Some instruments themselves will allow you to layer internally. So if we wanted to go to a different, you know, if we add a Halley and Sonic instrument here, we could just come and we could layer different voices there. But let's say I wanted to come here, we'll load up a patch from Simple. <laughs> All right, um, but another method to do this that a lot of people miss is, let's say, okay, I want to come here. And I'll add a couple of instrument tracks. So let's say a retro log. I love when you just randomly pick a patch and retrolog and it's just amazing. All right. Uh, so, you know, I'll just add one more instrument and you could do this with, in, with this method I'll show with any number of instruments. All right. So if I wanted to layer those different sounds together, so let's say I have a electric piano organ, synth. Um, so what you could do is just put these different tracks into a folder. And now as soon as I have created a folder I could take these particular instruments. All right, so and take the electric piano, the organ sound, and I'm gonna put these into the folder. And now I could just arm the particular folder. And as I record, so I will solo this. And as I record now, I could just... that as we've recorded information, it's now recorded onto four tracks all stacked, just like that. So you could create folder tracks and just have a hundred different instruments stacked together. So that's another method if you need to use beyond four. All right, and I thought I saw a question earlier that I may have missed from Soren. Let me just see if I... Okay, so we had uh, from Soren says, hi, Greg Soren in Sweden. Uh, question, can you show how to make spectral layers not need to dongle as a feature of today's update, it seems? So I think it might utilize the soft e-licensor. I haven't gotten the, I, I didn't get a chance to download the uh, update. I, I saw that one was released, but I kind of had meetings from, uh, from start of business all the way until the live stream, so. If you want to ask me on Friday's live stream, I'd be happy to kind of probably have a better answer for you if you want to email me. Okay, so I just see a question. After using a vocal stem from Spectral Airs on its own track, can you undo the original track and not affect the stems pulled out? Okay, so let's take a look. My spectral is just acting up a little bit this morning. We'll see if it's gonna act up again, so. Yeah, so, um, yeah, my spectral layers is acting up. I may have to 
just reinstall it. But um, once you've done the extraction, you'll see the different layers. Um, but what you could do, and let me just read the question, make sure I'm answering it right. Um, so I think what you could do is just come over here and, you know, if you do like a new track version or duplicate the track version. So let's say if I'm here and I wanted to duplicate the version and then you could do spectral layers on one and you may have to bounce this as a separate file. And then you could have the original plus the ones that are unmixed. So try when you do the spectral layers editing, and again, you might have to select the new unmixed uh, files. And at this point, um, do a, you might have to go to the audio menu and to bounce the selection. And at that point, you might, uh, I think you could bounce back and forth between the original files and all of the files that are kind of broken out together. All right, so we have Carl checking in from Devon in UK or Devon, UK. All right, so I just see a um, one, uh, just a getting a license missing on Halion Symphonic Orchestra after a few seconds of having the plugin window open. So let me know, Chris, um, if you have Dorico 4 installed because the content, you know, the instrument set, you may have to download the latest instrument set for Halion Symphonic Orchestra um, because I think that the Dorico version is, if you have Dorico 4 installed with the Halion Symphonic Orchestra there, that that's under the new licensing system. Um, so you, it may be running under the new uh you know, the new licensing system as opposed to e-licensor. So if you let me know if you have the, um, if you see, if you have Dorco 4 installed. All right, and we have Fiseha from uh, South Korea. Thanks for joining us. There's, it's probably very late. All right, and we have Craft Your Music checking in from Michigan and Tony Stevens from Boulder, Colorado. Beautiful city, miss going to Boulder. All right, and we have David, we have Dave McKay checking in from Nashville. Thanks for being a part of the live stream today. And we have Renee from Quebec. Okay, so we see, uh, do you have to render stems from spectral layers to use uh, other processes on them? How does spectral layers affect tempo tracks on stems? So, you know, spectral layers won't affect tempo tracks. You know, the audio will play back at the same speed. But, you know, once you just drag, and I'm sorry, my spectral layers isn't working, but once you just drag the layer out onto the project window, at that point, it'll be a separate audio file that you could process separately. All right, uh, so question. On the last stream, we talked about gain staging. You told that one of the best ways is to use a VCA fader. So if I want to down all my channels to minus five, also do you need to include the groups? You can include the groups if you, if you feel the need to, but obviously the channels will be kind of fed in, you know, the channels are sent to VCAs. If they're also sent to groups, you know, you, it may be redundant. But if you needed to include the groups, like if you're doing parallel processing, you could do that as well. Okay, so we have Alexander Plasco checking in from Connecticut. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and we have another question. How can I get the best input level using my Steinberg UR22 in Cubase 10.5 for my guitar and bass? So I think if you put it into... Uh, either input one or two will have a high Z switch. I think it might be input two will have a high Z switch and that's gonna be allowing you to kind of match the impedance of that input directly into 
that's coming from a guitar or an electric bass direct. So make sure that I think it's input to, but I could be mistaken, that you have the high Z button uh, enabled for that, and that will set the that will tell the input to look for the correct impedance from the guitar or bass, and then just adjust the gain knob up. You'll see, like you know, as you hit it, like very hard when you see the little red light on a UR22. At that point, just back off a little bit so that you're not clipping uh, the input. But if you do that, but make sure you do hit the high Z switch when connecting a guitar or bass directly into the system. All right, so we have the Studio International checking in from Lincolnshire, UK. So thanks for joining in Great Britain. All right, so we see a uh, question. Is it possible to tape external MIDI control instead of click with a computer mouth when we want to calculate the tempo? Thank you from South Korea. Um, okay, so maybe is it possible to take external MIDI control instead of click uh, with a computer mouse? Um, so it's not going to necessarily do it live. It won't necessarily react live to the computer mouse, but what you could do is if you wanted to set the tempo from, you know, like to set the tempo. So if we come here to the beat calculator, at this point you could just click on tap tempo um, and then you could click with the mouse. So as I click the mouse button or the space bar, I could get a sense of what the tempo is. So let's say, so that will calculate the tempo for you if you wanted to do it that way, but it's not going to react live. It's not gonna just change the tempo based on that particular uh, tempo map. But if we go to, let's say the, uh, to a tempo track and we go to the tempo editor Sorry, let me just go to a different project. It has a tempo track. Let's see if we could. So if we have, if you hit control T, you know, one of the things that you could do also is if you go to the top here, uh, there's a tempo recording function. Uh, and what this will allow you to do is as we do kind of your tempo recording, you can click on this icon, it's a little subtle. Uh, and then as you record, you could just record uh, different tempo changes. So while you're just here, we could just say, okay, I wanted this to speed up and slow down. We could adjust the tempo live during playback just like that and record those particular results. All right, so we have Crocante, Crocant from Los Angeles. Thanks for checking in. All right, we have Millard Brown from Pennsylvania. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, can you do a setup on linking two to three UR824s together, please? Um, so I don't have a UR824 anymore. Uh, but what you would do is it's a USB based interface and generally the USB interfaces can't be stacked like uh, Firewire or Thunderbolt interfaces can. So when you, if you wanted to use three interfaces of a UR824, the UR824 has 16 channels of ADAT light pipe. So you could have one of the interfaces, one of the UR824s functioning as the primary interface and take the ADAT output out of interfaces two and three and connect it digitally via a, a toss link cable, like an optical digital cable. And then the eight mic pre's you could have from inputs one, uh, from one through eight 
on on UR 824s 2 and 3 could be used to feed into the digital input so you could have 24 channels but it's not where you just connect the three interfaces via USB so in essence one is going to be utilized as an audio interface and the other two will be utilized as a converter that will take the mic pre's the output of the mic pre's into uh, you know, and out of the digital ADAT connection, so eight channels through a single cable into the other channel. So that will allow you to have 24 ins and outs if you have the the uh, ADAT digital inputs and outputs connected together. All right, so we see Jazz Dude saying, uh, if you like this informa informative hangout, uh, subscribe and don't forget to hit the like button. So that allows us to continue to do these live streams. So thanks for mentioning that. And if you do learn something new, make sure you do hit the like. Okay, so I see from uh, Chris Hallam, it says, I, I do have Dorco 4 installed, yes. Um, so I think it's gonna be, I'll see if I could trace that down, but um, but I think it's, you know, it might check on your Steinberg. You may have to install a later version of uh, the Dorco sound set or of the Howian Symphonic Orchestra sound set uh, in you know, for Cubase to recognize it, but I could see if I could find out uh, an answer for you, but I think it's gonna be that. All right, so we have JVI just uh, checking in from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, uh, and he just says, thanks so much for these hangouts. I'm glad to help people. So, and thanks for being a loyal attendee. Nick is saying Dave the Songle, so that's good. All right, so I'm just seeing uh, that it is input two on the UR22 that has a high Z switch. So thanks for your confirmation. Mine's kind of buried under my desk. All right, so we just see uh, from Jazz Dude just saying uh, we're going to see a lot of confusion about licensing, which wouldn't have existed without the dongle. So please, Steinberg, just keep the dongle hardware solution, add the new licensing as an option. So the licensing with the e-licensor is intrinsically tied to to the application. So there's probably thousands of different checks with the uh, with the program um, to look for the USB e-licensor. Uh, so, you know, you'll, I think that with the new licensing system, you'll see that a lot of parts of the program will be faster. Uh, and also so that, and since there is numerous calls to the dongle, that's why it's going to be an on off switch and why the two can't run concurrently, but it's also leads us to a lot of different stuff. Like I was just on a meeting today with, you know, and you know Berkeley College of Music, their film score department, they they teach Cubase there, and they're very excited for all the different licensing options that weren't available with the dongle based system. So, um, but I I think you know once you try it out that it'll that you'll like it and you could try it with you know even Dorco Elements or Dorco SE, which is a free version of Dorco to get experience with it. Okay, so it says, um, so it says one Cubase Eleven Pro just new, but I can't use it if I remove the USB E licensor. Uh, is it like that or something else? So it, you will need to have the USB E licensor connected. Um, when Cubase Twelve is released, it won't. You will be, you, you know, won't utilize the USB E licensor at that point, so it won't need to be connected. So, but currently with with Cubase Eleven, it'll need to be connected. So. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how can I import existing audio files into Cubase, into Cubase because it doubles as I import it? Um, so a as you go to import audio files, all you have to do is click on import audio file and you could select the audio file like so. 
If it's being doubled, it might be that the audio file is being moved into the project folder. Uh, so if we, if you don't want that, we could go to your preferences and if we go to editing, I think it's under editing audio and import audio files. We could just, uh, you could uncheck, uh, copy all files to project folder, but just importing the file into Cubase won't duplicate or double the file. But if you have this preference checked, uh, and this is one of those dialog boxes that comes up once and you can say, don't show me again. Uh, you know, you could have it do the open options dialog and you could choose, but just uh, try going to editing to audio and activating or checking the copy all files to project folder. If you uncheck that, then the imported file will remain into its current location. All right, so we have a uh, three. What are the main steps to mix and master my song? So you know, when you do have a song, you want to you know, when mixing, you may want to just you know, make sure that the balances between the the different instruments are fine, and kind of what you want. So let's say if I was mixing here. Let's say even though I'm a bass player, if the bass is like this loud in the mix, that might be too loud. So you want to check your levels. And also when you come here, make sure that you have the EQ. So whether it's going to be brighter or darker. And then if you wanted to add different effects, like let's say on our snare, so if I wanted to come here, we could add different reverbs. So let's say we'll just even put a room works on. So now we could take our snare and this will be going through a reverb. Or if we want to take, you know, different insert effects at that point and you know we could if i wanted a channel an effect that couldn't be shared i could do that as an insert effect and then on your master fader i mean mastering is entails a lot of different stuff but for a lot of people it means just kind of processing uh the the entire mix together so if i wanted to do that i could let's say while i'm playing I could just come to my channel EQ here and we'll have like even a channel strip. So if I wanted to run like saturation, so let's say I wanted to run the magneto too. And run a limiter. And for to bypass those. So now I could take kind of the entire file. So those are some things you could do to kind of, you know, start your mixing and mastering process on a particular project. Uh, obviously, every project will present different challenges and different requ different requirements, but that's a, a kind of a general way of thinking about it. Okay, so we just see a uh, question, uh, chord pads, setup, start note, pad, layout, start note. Manual says in keyboard mode, you can select the start note for the first chord pad. That doesn't seem as expected to work for me, thanks. Okay, so let's come over. I'll just sneak back to a different project here. And so if we want to trigger the chord pad from uh, your MIDI keyboard, um, so let's come over here and say, okay, I have um, 
my roads selected here. Let's say, I'll just get rid of my synth sack. Okay. Okay, so I'll go to my chord pads here. Um, okay, so let's. Okay, so now I have chord pads set as the MIDI input. And I'm gonna switch the transpose on my keyboard here. Wrong way. So now at this point we could see, so make sure that you have like for where you want it to be sent to that you have the chord pads as the MIDI input. And at this point, so now the chord pads are triggering. And when I play my MIDI keyboard for these particular notes, and if we go to um, the setup here, uh, let me just. Sorry, let me just. Okay, so we'll go to the, our chord pad settings. When you go to the um, player remote, you could, you know, just come right over here and choose, okay, I want this to start at C0 and end at B1. So we could just come right over here. And as we just click right here in the settings, we go to the pad chord remote. And I'm just triggering these. directly from my MIDI keyboard. Uh, so if I want to do it from virtual keyboard, so you guys could see it as well. So now, So we'll just go to our chord pads here so you can see that we're gonna just trigger these. So let me know if you're doing that, but make sure that you have the track set to chord pads as the MIDI input, uh, and then you'll see like there's different options appear. Alexander Plasco saying, oh, push uh, the like button, so that's good. Um, all right, so we see from the, the Studio International, thanks for the information on UR824. Once set up, do you leave the second and third units disconnected from the USB connection? So yes. Uh, so you could, you could have it connected from USB, but you're primarily gonna be using the one uh, USB audio, you know, the, the primary unit through USB and the others don't need to be connected. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Hi, Greg, how can I edit and reset the tempo of imported audio files in musical mode? So if you know kind of what the tempo actually is, if you go into the pool window, so under media, you can go to the pool window and then you'll see uh, the tempo for the particular file and all you have to do is double click and type to enter in the new tempo value. Uh, if you don't know what the tempo is, there's uh, you could go to your um, select it, go to project to tempo detection, and that could find out the tempo of the audio. And then if we go to advanced, we say set definition from tempo. That will apply the tempo changes from the particular from the tempo detection into the metadata of the audio file, but. Uh, if you wanted to just manually type it in, go to your pool window, and then you'll see the tempo, select a file, and you'll see the tempo information right there where you could enter in a new value and hit enter. All right, so we see Captain Energy Music from Pennsylvania on the live stream, saying, wishing everyone a happy March 1st. All right, and we have, I think it's, Vira or Vira Studios wishing, saying 
Hello to everyone from all over the world. It's kind of you. All right. All right. So we see uh, how to make two, how to make, how to seamlessly make two different audio samples overlap in the same audio track. I tried crossfade, but it doesn't really work. Um, so if I have two files here, um, you know, we could think of your, you know, we want to have like one sound at a time, but let's say if I duplicate this drum loop here, all right, so we have this and if I, just come over here and I have the two of them overlapping. So right now, you know, we could have this play until the end, or if we choose this, we have it start right there. But if I wanted to hear both of them, we could just come and hit X. So in this, you know, it's not going to be kind of designed to merge the two events, you know, because we have basically unlimited tracks of audio. So it may not be necessary, but if you wanted to just do a actual tempo. So now we'll hear kind of both playing together. And if you wanted to adjust, you know, the, uh, you know, the crossfade, we could ad adjust the crossfade to kind of line up rhythmically more, but then both of those will play back together. But, you know, it's it's intended to kind of have one voice per track playing. Uh, and, you know, if you need to have both of them playing at the same time, just simply put it on two different tracks, um, you know, because usually playing back a lot of tracks isn't a particular problem. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, hey, Greg, if I duplicate a track and start editing one of those, uh, Cubase asks me if I want to create a new version or to apply edit to all versions. I accidentally clicked on apply it to all. Uh, let's see, and that's the default now. How can I change this again? So this is just going to be a preference. So if we come over here, uh, go to your Cubase to preferences and under editing audio and you'll see on processing shared clips You could have it automatically open the options dialog or process existing clip or create new version So once again go to your preferences to editing to audio and look under on processing shared clips and then you'll be able to just Set how you want that behavior to change or if you want the dialog box to come up again Okay, let's see if my chat field may jump to see some earlier questions. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, so Mark Raven, just wishing everyone a happy Mardi Gras, y'all. So and Mark used to live in New Orleans, New Orleans, if I believe. Okay, so I just see um, from Andy, CC121 track scrolling and mixer view gets interrupted, halted if I position group tracks in between other tracks. Uh, for example, VST audio returns plus folder tracks have to be open, any workaround. So let me see if I have my... CC 121, let me see if I get it connected. 
quickly hang on just a second. Okay, so let me just create the scenario now. All right, so CC121 is connected and turned on. Okay, so uh, when tracks corner mixer view gets interrupted if I position uh, group tracks in between other tracks. Okay, so let me just So I'll just add a number of group tracks here. I'll activate the project first. Right, and I'll go ahead and just position these and I'll have my folder track open. I'll create a folder track for, let's say I have my folder track for all my drums uh, and I'll add some VST instrument channels. And I'll put them Okay, and I'll put separate the guitars here. Okay, so let's say I go into my full screen mix console. I have this channel selected. Okay, so I'm just holding down the channel select icon here and as you kind of go through all my channels it seems to be fine so um so it says cc121 tracks going to mixer view gets interrupted halted if i position a group tracks in between other tracks uh for example vst audio returns plus folder tracks have to be open any workaround all right so let me go ahead and close the folder tracks here so let's say while I'm in the mixer, yeah, so, you know, when we, if we have the folder track closed, let's see if we come over to our large scale mixer. So if I'm in the standalone mixer, that doesn't really um, so see, okay. So it looks like maybe if we have the tracks open here, so if I have the folder tracks open, it will allow us to navigate quickly. And even if we go to the larger mixer, and let's say if we So it seems like um, I see where that could be annoying, but let me just come here and see if we do that one more time. So it's gonna stop right at kind of the folder track. So I don't know of a workaround for that. Let me, um, but I could see where, you know, you can maybe create a macro to automatically kind of you know, open up the folders in the mix console. So, but I'll pass that along as some feedback.
Okay, uh, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg, uh, please show basic operation of macros and what we can do with it. So a macro is going to be uh, a basic uh, function. Like, you know, we, we could assign different keyboard shortcuts to create macros. So let's say um, I wanted to create a macro, you know, that was going to be a couple of steps. So when we go to our key command, we could click on hide or show macros here. So once we have macros chosen, what we could do with a macro is just to um, come here and we'll, I'll go through, so move, let's find one that comes with it. Um, Okay, so we, we can say selected tracks to new folder and add group channel. So what we could do with macros is often just kind of come to the point where instead of doing multiple key commands repeatedly, that we could have these in a macro and trigger a key command so that it actually goes through a number of different steps. And these get to be like really... Um, could be a very powerful thing. So let's say for, I, I created a macro, and a lot of people use this one, for minimizing breaths in a vocal. So what we could do, instead of having to do this process over and over again, what we could do is just kind of come over here and um, create a macro. So if I wanted to do something that could be monotonous, like, okay, let's say, I don't have a vocal on this file, but let's say, uh, as we'll imagine that we have a vocal, and as we're working with the particular vocal that we want, um, let's say as we're looking at it here and we grab our range selection tool, let's say this was a breath. So, and I, instead of me having to go through here to split the events, to come here and move this like a thousand times where I'm gonna just be very tedious. I can now come select that range and we go to run the macro. I could just say, let's just minimize breaths. And at that point, it will just select that range, cut it and drop it down by 12 dB volume wise. So we could, have them instead of having to do this process like a hundred times, you know, where maybe it's three steps or maybe it's 12 steps. We, I could just have these in a macro, and at that point, we could, you know, trigger those particular macros that we'll see available here. We could trigger those from key commands as well, but it's really just a series of key commands that allow you to do multiple functions through a single function. So JBI is just wishing he could be in New Orleans today. Yeah, one of my neighbors, he grew up in New Orleans and he took his daughter down from Mardi Gras to see family. So see some people unknown is a countdown to Cubase 12 release. Cap Energy music was nice and classy. He says, not asking when it's coming, but bringing it up, saying it'll be released when it's ready. You see Captain Energy Music just uh, talking to jazz dudes as I just literally wake up every day and one of the first thing I do is hit the Steinberg site easy enough. I was kind of thinking it would have been today, would have been cool, but not when it's ready. So
Let's see, Best Screen Jesus just says, finally did a deep dive into Patch Shop 2. Wow, it's incredible. So yeah, it's an incredible instrument. It's already, you know, I think its first year is released. It won all sorts of awards as well. All right, so uh, we have a question from Alex Morgan. Uh, Hi, Greg, can you help with the project logical editor setting to delete muted tracks? Uh, not muted parts, but muted tracks. Thank you. All right, so let's take a look, see if we could do this. Okay, so I'm gonna mute a number of tracks here. So let's go to our project logical editor, see if we could get this configured. Okay, so I'm gonna say container type is equal to track. Uh, first thing we want to do is to delete and we'll say the property is set to, uh, let's see if we, if we choose event is muted. So that's all you have to do. Um, so we can see that none of the events are muted, just the tracks. So if we come over here, we could say function delete. Container type is equal to track. So we want to track and not the event. Uh, property, um, we'll, under filter target property, property is set to event is muted. So now as soon as we run that, all the muted tracks will be erased. I'll go ahead and save that in case I need to recreate that later. All right. Uh, all right, so you see a question. Hi, Greg, is there a manual on all the features in a logical editor and how to use it? Thanks in advance. So there is full documentation on what each, uh, you know, what each filter target is, what the different values for different MIDI messages. So they are there. Um, so, you know, it is part of the documentation. It goes through it in, in pretty good detail. If you have particular questions on different tasks or uses of the logical editor, I'd be happy to kind of uh, create a preset for you or show you some, if you have a specific question on, I want to do this or do that, or what's the best approach for this. Okay, so we see uh, chord pads follow up uh, into setup, choose the pad layout, the third one, and look at this start note parameter. We have C, A, E chords. Uh, what does it do? Thanks again, so let's take a look. So we'll activate this project. Okay, so I'm gonna set the chord pad input here. Okay, so once again, a question is, Okay, so it says in the setup, so we'll come over here to setup. The third tab is um, choose the pad layout and look at the start note parameter. We have CAE choices. 
All right, so. Okay, so we see, um, so once we do the pad layout, we have choices um, here where if I want to see it in a grid and I want to show the number of rows and I want to see number of columns, we, you know, instead of it being more of based around a MIDI keyboard, you know, we could come here and choose the keyboard where we can see different octaves. And if I wanted that octave to start on A uh, or let's say on E, we could choose like, you know, where the particular chords start, but this will allow us to, you know, so we, as we look at this, we could say that, you know, when we go to the pad layout, if we choose C, that the first note within the chord pad layout will be C, and if we choose E, we'll see our first note will be E followed by F, F sharp. So we could kind of change the particular order of, you know, what note is used to trigger it, or if you want it to be, you know, on a grid instead. So here we can see, you know, up to 64 different chord pad voices, but if we just look at it, um, you know, so that's what the first starting note is. So we see this is a C here. If I wanted to start on A, so A, B flat, B, C, etc. So that's just kind of the first note that we see as part of the chord pad triggers. All right, uh, so we see, how do you match the key of a loop to the project's key of the song? So a lot of times if you're doing something like that, there are some, some loops that will have the key. The vast majority of loops don't have the key uh, in them. So you have to, you'll have to kind of do it um, by, by ear. So let's say if I want it to, you know, have this loop, and I wanted to add, you know, like maybe, a, like a bass or something. I could come here. And I'll put that into musical mode. But now if I wanted to put in a different synth, you know, this may not fit the key. Let's say we have these playing together. You may have to just, while that's playing, just come here and you'll see a transpose function and just do that. But, you know, many programs, you know, if it's set to, okay, I'm in C minor, you know, you could transpose up, but if the loop was in a major key and you're dropping into a minor key, it's not going to, you know, we can pitch shift all of the contents of the loop up, but it's not going to say, okay, this is automatically now going to be in C major for the audio. So. So we're seeing Mark Rabin giving, saying he's grateful to Jan for his work with the Cubase uh, index.com site. All right, so we see a question from Benny um, just saying, hi, Greg, you showed in a previous stream the the strings option in expression maps, staccato, legato. Can you show again? I hope you understand what I mean. Thanks. So yeah. Um, so when we ha are utilizing instruments that are being used for uh, like orchestral stuff where you may have different, um, you know, different articulation requirements, we could come over here. Let me just find my project.
Okay. And depending on the instrument, you may have to, you know, many libraries will come with expression maps because it utilizes their particular, uh, you know, because many of the instruments will come with expression maps. Sorry, just have annoying meeting messages going on in a meeting I'm not at because I'm doing this. All right, so, so when we want to, but you know, so we may just come over here and load up. If we're using third-party libraries, you go to the expression map setup, and here we could, you know, just load different expression maps. So many, oftentimes, they're available online with all the different articulations. So when I go to violin one here for this particular library, I can see my trills, uh, you know, my different articulations for violin one. Now to see that in the actual uh, editor, I would... Just come here and as we double click, we could see instead of choosing velocity, I would just choose articulations and dynamics. And now that we're here, uh, you know, and I should mention if it's a Hallian based instrument, you like when we go to, uh, you know, the editor here, we could go to uh, expression map. And if it's a Hallian based instrument, you could just uh, choose to uh, import the expression maps. So if I come here, we could just import the key switches and that will automatically create these so we don't have to create them because Hallian is smart enough to convey all the articulations used in instruments in the editor so it shows up here so if I wanted to solo just the violin part here and change the articulations so now if we want to go so we could just change those particular articulations. Let's say, okay, I wanna put tremolo in here. So, and at this point I could just say, okay, I want that to be. So as we change now and we could at this point just put it back to legato so this way we could have the articulations of different samples automatically be able to change so that's a great feature of cubase and it's another pioneering concept that steinberg kind of introduced to the world and many companies have tried to copy since All right, so we see Michael Pierce is in the live stream. So thanks for joining us. And we see he's recovering. So any of us were on the Zoom meetup, or as Michael is not is feeling under the weather. So we hope your recovery continues. And thanks for popping in and saying hi. All right, so we see Cubase 12 tomorrow. Is it official? So the only official announcement I've heard is that it'll be in March. So, um, so we'll just have to wait and see. So, yeah, you know, today is March 1st, so it could still be a while. So, okay, so we have a question about the URE24. Uh, just one more question the ADAT from the main 1A in and out to, let me see if it's continued on. Yeah, uh, so it says uh, with the, so just one more question. Uh, the ADAT from main 1A in and out to unit two, B to three to the third unit. Yes, so that's how it's gonna work. So just that way, you know, so, you know, unit two is gonna be connected into ADAT port A or port one and, you know, port two could be the third interface. So then you would have 24 inputs of all the same mic pre's and those are wonderful mic preamps. All 
right? So see, uh, Mark Rabin has in the 50s in Montana where he lives. So that's great. Enjoy the day. I think we have 59 degrees here for our high just out in Virginia. All right, so we see Chris Tazi, and you know, as we mentioned before, if you do update or upgrade to Cubase 11, it is eligible for the grace period. So I see Chris Tazi just saying, gonna get it right after we sign off here. I'll even let you kind of take a little break, and if you wanna get the update or upgrade, and then you can come back. But yeah, that'd be good to do. All right, so I see from Mark Rabin says, uh, what are you working on musically? How are you? What's been inspiring you lately? So I think this is uh, directed to me. So it says, at Cubase. So uh, work has been very, very busy recently. So uh, I'm looking forward to having a relaxing weekend. I have a hot mess tune to play on. So with Gareth and... Uh, Michael Teens and Pablo. So I'm looking forward to kind of playing bass on that and maybe having a day off or so next week to kind of rest up. So it's been a lot of 6 a.m. to midnight or 1 a.m. kind of weeks or, or days for a couple weeks recently. So I'm looking for that. But that's what I'm kind of working on musically. And um, so inspiring. So I think new stuff that we'll see coming in the future is inspiring too. So there's a lot of great stuff. I'm looking forward to be able to share with people. All right, so we have Spencer B from Atlanta, Georgia. Thanks for being on the live stream. And we have Aikens Beats, I believe. Uh, this is enjoying the lesson, so it's great. And we have Caracas, Venezuela joining. All right. And we have Geely, Ca Geely, California, maybe Geely CA or Geelica from California. Thanks for being a part of the live stream. All right, and we have High Tonic uh, watching from Bangladesh. Thanks for joining. You guys, it's probably very, times are very late or very early in the morning, so thank you so much. All right, so we see uh, what's the best folder structure for, for VST2, for VST plugins, version two and version three. So, you know, because VST2 plugins will kind of, you know, can be anywhere. Um, and Cubase has the ability of, once we go to a VST2 plugin, uh, and if I go to the correct window, that would be helpful. So say I go to my studio menu to the plugin manager, that at this point, um, we will click on the little settings cogwheel here. So for VST2 plugins, it doesn't really matter where they are, but just, try to be aware of where they're being installed to. So a lot of times what I would, when I was dealing primarily with VST2 plugins, I would put them into like a program files, uh, like Steinberg VST plugins. And then you know, I would put a different folder for different companies so that I could find them. With VST3 plugins, they're all installed by design into a common folder so that we don't have to worry about assigning the folder, you know, it's kind of an annoyance to a lot of people. It's like, I bought this plugin, I installed it, installed right, but it's not showing up. So um, because they didn't have the VST plugin path settings defined, uh, like I think NI was, you know, always puts it into a folder that's very unexpected for a lot of plugin hosts. So you have to kind of manually search for it and it's kind of an annoyance. 
So the VST3 plugins are all going to be installed into a common location so that you don't have to worry about what folder it is and it's kind of fixed that way. So we just see a uh, comment uh, that expression slash articulation in Halion is nice. Yeah, that's it's a great thing to be able to have the expression maps automatically create it. All right. Yeah, so I see Michael Pierce's comment. So we hope you get better very soon. Um, all right, so I see a question. Uh, hello, I just bought Cubase 11 Pro. Will I, get a, will I get 12 when it is released? So yeah, since November 10th, I believe, this year, and I could be mistaken on the exact date, but I think from November 10th of last year, rather, to until Cubase 12 is released, whenever that is, it's automatically part of the grace period update. So it will, at that point, automatically, uh, as soon as 12 is released, you'll auto, your license will be eligible for running Cubase 12. Okay, so just see a uh, question. This might be directed to other people. Are there any machine users here and do you use it inside of Cubase or like me? Uh, not and use Cubase for mixing. So I think it makes sense to have everything kind of inside the DAW uh, and it gives you a lot more flexibility. I think if you, um, I, you know, I, I always, I never appreciate it kind of having limited capabilities. I may not want to use all the extensive capabilities, but I didn't want to be kind of in a project and say, oh, I, I chose the wrong path and now, I'm at the end of a short haul when I wanted to continue walking down and continue doing my project as it evolved. So I don't want to have any artificial restrictions put on me. So I think most people will run it inside of Cubase, but I'm not a real, I, I don't have a license of machine and not an expert on it. All right, so we have Kerwin Young. It was great to see you on the live stream or the Zoom meetup on Friday and he's checking in from Chapel Hill. So my brother used to live there. All right. All right, so we see question mark, new version soon, waiting to buy. So I, you know, Steinberg has announced that there will be Cubase 12 coming in the first quarter of the year. Um, and since it is March, I assume that will probably be this month, but according to what Steinberg has announced. All right, so we see just a comment. I like the way VST3 is installed, especially for inexperienced users. It's much easier. So yeah, it's just wanted to make sure that everyone could find the plugins that they installed and purchased. All right, so we have Raphael checking in from Austria. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, uh, so we just see... Um, Question, there's a shortcut, close gaps crossfade. In this case, the right event will close to the left selected event. I also need the opposite function of the left event will close to the right event. All right, so let's see if we can get this going here. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. I hope that everyone has learned some new things. All right, so let's say if we have our audio event here, so I'll just select these two events and I'll just do a quick bounce selection to make them one nice happy file. We'll replace the events. All right, so let's say at this point I've separated the, I split the events and they're separated. All right, and we'll have our gap. Okay, so let's say I have these two events selected. 
and we see kind of like this transition here. So we go to audio, and I think it's under uh, advanced. So we can say close gaps time stretch. So as we do this, we notice that this event moved from the left to the right. Okay, so in this case, the right event will, okay. All right, so um, there's a shortcut, close gaps, crossfade, and this, the right event will close to the left selected event. I also need the opposite function of the left event will close to the right gap. Um, so it says the only shortcut is close gaps time stretch. Uh, is there another way I can close gaps without the time stretch function? So, you know, when we were closing the gaps between these two, so let's say now if I have these two, we go to audio to, uh, you know, close gaps time stretch. So when we do that, that will time stretch that particular event. Um, if you, you know, so if we have to fill that material with something, but let's say maybe if I cut and I do a, you know, if I don't want to affect the rhythmic timing of that, let's see what happens here. So now it'll, you know, if you don't want to affect kind of the rhythmic integrity of it, you could just, you know, like I just did here and just cut maybe like just that tip. Um, so it's not going to kind of move the other files, but as I click here, this will time stretch it. But, you know, it has to, you know, if you want kind of the seamless audio, you know, it's, you know, and you don't want silence between it, it's going to fill it with something. So if I just say, okay, time stretch that, it'll just do that little bit without doing all the others but otherwise you know uh you know it's it you know has to fill it with something it's not going to just kind of make up audio in between so it's going to take the audio and time and crossfade it or time stretch the audio to kind of fill that gap so but let me know if i'm misunderstanding your question All right, so we see Nuendo 12, when? So, you know, um, at, probably after Cubase. All right, so we just see, I uh, hope Cubase 12 will incorporate a full interface revamp uh, would, that will substantially accelerate my workflow. So probably if we had a full interface revamp, it would slow things down. Um, but I think there's a lot of great features that people will see. All right. Okay, so let me just go through. Um, all right, just had a message come in. Let me just read through some more comments. I see people saying hi to Kerwin. Okay, so I think I may be caught up with different questions. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, I think I had some questions that were emailed in, so let me jump to those. Bear with me just for a second. All right, and again, if you've learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button. Okay, 
So we had a question mailed in, how to change the contrast in the background of the MIDI key editor? All right, so that's a great question. So let's go ahead and take a look. So let's say if we have our MIDI key editor, let me just revert to project here quickly. Okay, so let's say we go to the key editor background and sometimes we'll see uh, like the keys kind of indicated here, but maybe people want more contrast between or like a brighter background for this. Um, so we could see kind of, you know, the keys indicated, we see kind of lighter and darker shades. So if we wanted to adjust the editor appearance, we could come over here and just say, uh, go to, user interface and go to track and mix console channel colors. Uh, and at this point, or we'll go to color schemes rather, sorry about that. And we could go to the editor area background. And at this point, I'm just gonna change to kind of the vertical line and we'll move this up and hit okay. So we could adjust kind of the, you know, where we could see brighter lines here, or if we wanted it to be slightly darker, we could, you know, we could adjust the various lines right here. So I think this is maybe the default state uh, and I'll just click on default. So just once again, go to preferences to editing and under user interface, go to color schemes. And here you could see for different aspects of the program, but we could say editor area background and I'll say the vertical you know, and just adjust this up and you could just double click and type in a particular value here as well. So we could just move it up and that will allow you to have different contrast or different color schemes for the MIDI key editor to kind of make it match kind of more previous versions as well. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to make the Q link also include the plugins bypass button in the plugins GUI, not just the mixer? Okay, so let's take a look. So let's say I'll just add a, so I'm gonna Q link and add a delay or just we'll add a to tube on all of the selected tracks. Okay, and if we come over here, Okay, so we have the plugin on all of them. All right, so if you wanted to bypass. Okay, so let's say if we're in the plugin itself, so, you know, when the, the Q link, I believe, will allow us to, you know, it's for mixer functions, but let's see if we come over here and bypass within the particular plugin as well with Q-Link active. I don't think that this would work because the Q-Link is gonna be more for other items. But I'll move this up top. Yeah, so, I, 
not all plugins will have kind of the bypass thing within the plugin, I believe. Um, so I think it's just going to be, you know, mostly while I think that we could change parameters, I don't think that the bypass will, um, will work on different plugin settings. So, you know, the settings will work. So as I move one here, they'll automatically tie over, but I don't think that the bypass uh, of the plugin is a queue linkable thing, uh, but I'll pass it along as a suggestion. Okay, uh, so I just see when I do only fader automation on a track, all my plugins of that track get the automation activated. How can I fix that? Okay, so I think it's, you know, as we do automation on a particular track, so let's say if I come here, um, you know, and we activate automation, you know, anything, you know, by default, if I come here and we're automating and I adjust the EQ, that all of these particular things are uh, set to be automated by default. But I think if we come over to your automation panel, which we could access by clicking here or by hitting F6, um, that we could choose to suspend writing of different aspects. So I could say, I only want to write volume automation. So now even though everything in the channel is set to automate, like I may be searching for an EQ function here. So let's say I want to automate uh, my volume on this particular track. So I'll just go to an audio track here, sorry. So let's say I'm automating this. So I could change the volume, I could change the panning. So I'm gonna change the panning here. I'm gonna go to an EQ. And as I adjust the EQ, I'm going to change this. I'm gonna go to uh, a plugin. So I just wanna come to step filter and let's automate some of the different parameters here. So now we look at it, none of those different parameters have been written and it's only gonna be the volume automation just because we could choose to suspend writing of different aspects of automation and just suspend writing of, you know, panning, EQs, dynamics, sends, inserts, mute, uh, and others. So that way we're only going to be able to write volume automation and nothing else will be written. So give that a try in the automation panel settings. Okay. So we have a question. Um, is there a way newly created tracks that don't get automatically added to previously created mixer configurations? So currently that, you know, that's still at, as a track is added. So let's say I have a mixer configuration here um, for my eight audio tracks. So when I go into, uh, let's say my mix console, my large screen mix console, and I only want to see those particular tracks. Um, and now when, let's say I, Go to another mix configuration. So we'll save this as configuration one. So I think this still kind of works the same way. Um, and I want it to, let me come here to show all channels. And now uh, I want to hide everything but those. So I'm going to add this configuration. Uh, so as two, okay. So now I'm going to add an audio track and we'll call this mess up. All right. So since an audio track has been added and we'll go to our mixer configuration, sorry about that. Um, so now when I go to mixer configuration one, the newly created track will still kind of migrate its way into 
existing configurations, uh, you could, you know, you know, you could just simply come over here and, you know, resave the configuration again. You could update the configuration, but I know it's kind of a pain. Uh, and I think it's kind of deep underlying code that might do that, but I'll re be sure to kind of reiterate that concept uh, to the development team and planning team again. All right, so we had a question mailed in. Are you guys coming out with a controller for us to control Groove Agent, like how Ableton has the push? That would be amazing. So, you know, there are a number of different controllers for Groove Agent, and Groove Agent is kind of set up where, you know, to access, you know, particular functions in Groove Agent, it doesn't have to be a specialized controller. So, you know, it just responds to standard MIDI messages. So any pad controller, uh, any, you know, keyboard MIDI controller that has pads on it works beautifully with it. So, you know, in previous years, we did like, I think 2008-ish, 2010-ish, 9-ish, we had the CMC PD controllers. Um, and those were quite popular, but uh, Yamaha chose to discontinue those because of some of the parts were missing and unavailable uh, back then. So, but, you know, most of the times when we do this, um, you know, for Groove Agent, all those functions will be, you know, equally addressable through any controllers where it's not really tied directly into proprietary hardware. So we want everyone to have access to the particular functions. All right, let's jump back to our questions. Just finding my place where I was before. See comment from Nick saying, if you turn around really closely so as not to scare it, you might catch a glimpse of Cubase 12 lurking behind you. But if you turn around too quickly, you'll scare it off. So. Okay, so we have Julio checking in from Colombia, and his question is, uh, how can you please show us all the methods to recording audio? I want to be very fast at recording, punching, et cetera. Thanks, man. Um, all right, so you know, there's a number of ways of just being able to, uh, if you wanna be fast with recording and punching, uh, you know, a couple of different ways is to just, you know, if I was working, let's say, okay, I want to take these particular tracks. Um, if I have, if I was doing like a live tracking session, a lot of times I would put stuff into a folder. Uh, like when I, you know, I've been involved with recording different festivals. Like I was, uh, one of the engineers on Eric Clapton's Crossroads Festival, the first one he did in Dallas. Um, so it was a lot of fun. I got to record amazing guitar players, including Eric Clapton and Eric Johnson, amongst others. Uh, but when what I would do is I would put like, and we're recording 48 tracks at 24 bit 96 K for like 18 hours. Um, but I would place everything into a folder track and then I would just arm the folder track without having to do all of the other tracks. So as soon as I come here, I could just say, Okay, I just want it to punch in on my folder. Um, and this way I didn't have to come over here and arm and record other tracks. Uh, so I didn't have to record like 16 or in my case when I was doing the festivals, like 48 tracks. And then as we stop, uh, we could just do that. If you want to quick, you know, naming files is really important uh, because, you know, if you don't name files, you could probably have like at least 4,000 audio files called audio zero one on your hard disk. And you may want to quickly rename tracks to do that. Come over here, just type a name 
and then hit the tab key. That will take you to the naming field of the next track automatically. So hit the tab and then you could rename just that easily. Um, when we want to do, you know, re-record is a great thing. So let's say the whole band is tracking here uh, and we could place the record mode into re-record. So let's say there's a lot of false starts and there's nothing kind of more frustrating than the band learning the piece of music live and having false starts. So let's say uh, we're playing and then I want to record right here. And then, you know, we have like the guitar introduction for two measures, two measures with the keys. And now the bass player and drummer messed up. So I'm just going to hit the record button again once we're in re-record mode. So or what happens a lot of times is people come here, hit stop, rewind, uh, and then uh, delete all the tracks and record again. So if we didn't want to do that, I could come over here and we'll hit record. So let's say, okay, we're recording. And then if they screwed up and the, you know, the bass player and drummer are screwing up their entrances, I could just click on the record button again. And once we're in re-record mode, at that point, uh, I just hit the button again. It takes me right back. I can start to count in. The files are erased. It rewinds to the previous recording. And then at that point, we could just start again. It's like, oh, keyboard player messed up, misses two-bar entrance. I just hit the record button again. And we just start new, just that fast, that easy. So the re-record mode is, is really phenomenal. Um, you know, if you have different takes, you can say, oh, that was a wonderful performance. I could select all of the tracks. So let's say I wanted to select all of these events here. Um, and I could just say, okay, we're going to do a new version. So without having to erase parts or do any rerouting, we could have different track versions. So let's say, okay, this will be take one take two and let's say if you're playing with like midi backing tracks i could just come over here instead of having each version kind of you know spread out to the right you know version one version two version three at this point i could just say oh let's just do a new version here and record and then as we do this we could just see our different tracks automatically populate come here and if we wanted to go back and let's say someone's like, oh, we did, you know, 16 different versions. You could say, oh, let's go back. I think the second one was really good. Now you just hit version two for all the selected tracks and you're directly right back to where you were. And if you needed to, you could take portions of version one, portions of version two, Port, you know, portions of version 15 and compile them together or just say, you know, uh, the drums were great on version three instead. So select the drum parts and switch those to version three. So we could do stuff like that. Now, as far as punch in and punch out, um, you know, just being able to any of the tracks, just hit the record button. So say if we're not in re-record mode, say we're just in punch in, punch out, you know, being able to just hit the record button, like the asterisk, the asterisk on the numeric keypad, to be able to just punch in and punch out. And if you want it to set sections for a punch in and punch out, there's a preference that we could set here. So let's go to your preferences and we'll say editing. And I think it's under um, project in mix console. You'll see just a function here for, uh, Okay, under editing rather, you'll see cycle follows range selection. So if we do this, if I wanted to set like punch in points on just like one particular track here, I could say, okay, I just wanted to uh, do a punch in just around this particular area. So the punch is kind of tied to the left and right locators. Uh, if we go to the top of a selection, I could set the, the range selection around a part that I want to punch and when we have this preference enabled, sorry for not, uh, of uh, cycle follows range selection. So if I, I say, okay, this is a great recording except for right here. At that point, we could just hit I and O for punch in and punch out. Uh, and we could activate it here on the transport. 
And as we do this, we can just now automatically, if the track is record enabled, that would help. Um, so the record enabled tracks can automatically punch in and now just punch out. So if you need to punch just one quick word, grab the range selection tool and then make sure your IO is found, is enabled, and then it'll just punch in and punch out. Now, if you need to give someone more of a context between the punch in and punch out points, like they want to do one word here, but they want to hear the whole phrase. There's another function, so I can come over here, go to the transport, and we'll go to punch points. So once we have punch points active, we'll say uh, set punch points to the selection range. So now I could have my punch points set just for this one particular word, and I could set my left and right locators for the bar. So now as I cycle, we could punch in just that one little se section over and over again, but it's not coupled to the particular cycle range. So we could decouple the punch points from the cycle when we get to transport to punch points. So those are some like quick tips to be able to record fast and just, you know, but always record everything. You know, I was the notorious guy who had always had the band, you know, we're just doing, we're just doing a level check. We're just checking things. So play through the song a couple of times. And then, uh, you know, while they would do that, I'm like, oh, that's great. All right, let's come in and listen. They're like, oh, we haven't recorded yet. And I was like, you know, I was recording every single take all the time and not telling the band because once you hit record and in, in the eyes of the band, you know, they're, they feel like they're under a microscope. But if you're just recording while you're doing level checks, they're playing better, they're not worried about it, they're in the right headspace, and you can get much better performances off in doing that. So a couple of tips, hope those are helpful. All right, so we see a uh, question. Hi, how about export video with 64-bit audio? Is it possible in Cubase 12? So no, because there aren't any video players that can play back 64-bit audio. So uh, when we do it, I believe it's just gonna export it as a 16-bit or 24-bit 48K file. So, um, you know, so again, most video players don't know, how, most audio programs can't play back 64-bit audio. So. At that point, it doesn't make much sense to include it if the video player would is incapable of actually playing it. So, Okay, so we see from Michael Pierce. Uh, oh, I forgot to say thank you, Greg, for the advice on track versions last week. Drum editing today made such a difference. It's now also consolidated on a new version. So yeah, that's great. I'm glad you discovered that. It's like, especially if you're doing like recording drums and bands in real time, it's a great solution, so. Okay, so Michael Pierce has slapped the like button in advance, even in his weakened sick state, uh, not feeling well. We appreciate it, Michael, and we hope you get better soon. All right, and we see Gareth on the live stream, so great to see you. All right, uh, so we see from a question, um, is there a command similar to Control plus Alt mute to always have the track armed to record? So anytime that, you, you know, there are preferences um, where anytime a track is selected that it could be armed for record. So if I just wanted to come here, I think if we go to uh, editing to project and mix console, so we could say enable record on selected tracks. So if I have that turned off, I click here, the record enable status isn't turned on. Uh, but as soon as the track is selected with that preference enabled, I can come right over here, apply. Now, anytime that I have a track selected, it could be set to arm to be record. So try that. And I think that, you know, if we also, um, 
you know, if we select another track that, you know, we could do, we could just do it like that. And I think, let's see if there's a, so, but, or you could just do it manually where it's independent of that. So, you know, if you want it to record enable, I think if you just come here, uh, let's deactivate the preference. So if you just click on R for record, then, you know, that will, that track will stay regardless of whatever the status is. So let me know if that works for you. So if you want it to be a selected track, which is a, a good method of doing that, but sometimes people may want to select another track and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm, you know, I threw this one out of record accidentally. So check for that preference. If not, you could just hit the R button and then that record enable status will automatically stick regardless of track selection. You see Gareth is whack alike, so that's great. All right, and we have Michael Teams from Texas. All right, and we see Michael Studios up and running again. He had like a power surge that blew up his his uh, surge compressor. So glad that you have everything working. Glad he didn't lose any studio equipment. All right, so just reading through comments. So we see the uh, Gareth is asking if the hot mess glass is three quarters full or empty. So I think three of us are on the live stream. If that's what you mean by the glass. So I'm looking forward to playing a bass line this weekend when things settle down. All right, so we have Dan Freeman checking in from Atlanta. Thanks for joining us. All right, and we have Michael Marshall from Somerset in the UK. All right, so we see Chris Tazi is now a Cubase 11 owner. Still have to download and install after we're done. So that's great. Congratulations. All right, so with Gareth's, Gareth screen, he says, ice cream, a big thanks to Michael Teams. So Michael Teams is always generously giving ice cream to people virtually on the live streams. So Gareth is so clever. All right, so just seeing uh, kind of more of a clarification about the closed gaps. So let's go ahead and take a look at that project again.
Okay, so let's say I cut here in the middle. All right, so between the two vents, and we'll just kind of take a look at the particular vents. So we can come here to audio to advanced and we'll say close gaps time stretch. So that will look at the events. It's gonna just time Okay, so say we do the crossfade. So it looks like the left went to the right with the cross, or the right went to the left. And we do the time stretch. The right, the left kind of goes to the right. So, but I guess, so. But if you could let me know like what you want to have in the gap, uh, Raphael, that would be helpful. Um, all right, so just seeing another further comment. It says, in my case, the selected events would be extendable like in a comping scenario. Um, So let's say if we put this into sizing applies time stretch, if you wanted to time stretch from the left to the right, will that work and do what you want? Because there are ways going time stretch from the, uh, or that was time stretching from the right to the left. So let me know if that might help. Um, so just seeing, in my case, uh, the selected events would be extendable like in the comping scenario. If you want to send me a quick video, perhaps, or a link to a video, that would be helpful. Okay, so we have um, Gary Ward just asking, hi, Greg, could you explain attribute and logical function in media patch selection? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at it. And this is in Media Bay. Let's see if we can make sense of it real quick. All right, so when we go to, okay, so here we could just say any attribute and we'll just say matches. So, and at this point we could just say, I want any any of the attributes matches tambourine. So let's say I type in TMB. But when I go to attributes, this can be tied into metadata. So I can say I want electronic music that's for pop that has that is dry. So attributes will give us more kind of characteristics, whereas an attribute will look for a single particular file. So if I'm here, I just want anything that has the word base in it. I, or uh, any attribute, or we could just say, if we wanted to come here, we could select a fil filter attribute if we wanted to, but this way we could kind of globally search for things. We're in logical, but in attributes here, we could kind of have things categorized based upon metadata. So whereas attribute will just allow us to find one particular file, one any attribute, or you know, it's based on these particular selected attributes. So attributes is more kind of a quick surgical search. Uh, and we could think of attributes as kind of filtering choices down by criteria that have been defined. Um, so we just see, 
And this was uh, from Chris to is directed to jazz dudes as I was just looking at Dorco, any tutorials there. So, you know, if you go to youtube.com slash Dorco, there's hundreds of tutorials there to guys do a wonderful job between Anthony and John Barron. And they have their uh, discover Dorco sessions. So that's their uh, once, I think it's once a month, they do their live stream as well. Okay, I'm just seeing if I missed a question earlier. So I just see, um, just comment, uh, for example, with the Curve EQ, um, this is from Uwe or Uwe Begans. So um, let me know if I missed like the first part of that question. I just kind of scrolled back and didn't see one. But if you could uh, maybe uh, tell me what the Curve EQ is about, sometimes I'll forget topics or questions all right so we see jvi just saying oh pressing tab to get to the next track name field revelation of the day so we'll give you that feature free all right so we see from graham witcher just saying hello greg and cubase friends hope you're all safe and well silly me i went to join friday's live stream at 8 p.m then realized it was end of month and the zoom so i missed it all well we missed you too so hopefully end of march we'll be able to all get together and have our zoom meet up and look forward to seeing you there See, Gareth said my uh, my recording technique was sneaky. So I'll tell you another sneaky recording technique. If you have a guitar player that's not re that's all kind of in the wrong headspace for a guitar solo, what I would do is make him stand on one foot and play the guitar solo. And they're so worried about falling from standing on one foot that they would play a great solo because their mind that was messing up their guitar solo was just really focused on trying to stand up. So I got many great guitar solos with that trick. You see Gareth saying same thing Bowie did to Stevie Ray Vaughan. So. Okay, my chat field jumped on me. All right, so. Nick is mentioning uh, record button equals musician cannot remember any songs. So, yeah. all right. So we see uh, Julio just saying extremely helpful recording tips. Thank you, Greg. All right. Okay, just reading through more comments. So thanks for all the great comments. Jazz dude, just reminding people not to hit the like or to hit the like button. Don't forget to hit the like button. So, all right. So we have. Marin or Marin from Cologne, Germany. Thanks for joining us. All right, I think I missed one question. Let me just. All 
All right, so just seeing kind of a further comment uh, from Raphael about the uh, gaps, just saying I don't want to um, close this. And he's just saying I don't want to uh, stretch my files or, or, or alter them in sound. So if you wanted two events to kind of match, um, like do you want to close the gap or do you want the two events? Because if we didn't want to alter the events, but we wanted them to match, I could select these and just go to uh, bounce selection and replace the events. And then we'll have one file where these aren't, and you know, it'll be one file with silence in the middle, but you know, um, but if you're using kind of the closed gaps, it's often to, you know, like, especially if you're doing like a lot of drum editing to make sure that there's no, you know, between edits where those will automatically crossfade. So if the end goal is to just have one file where these aren't stretched, um, but you know, something would, if you want those to be joined, you know, often if you're using the closed gaps functionality, it's going to time stretch some element of it to fit in the space. Uh, but if you don't want anything in that space, just do a bounce selection. Okay, here's a question I was looking for. Uh, so question, how to set up pre-gain on default CPR uh, file? Um, so, you know, if you, let's say if if you wanted to, let's see if we come here to a new project, um, we'll create empty. So, the, you know, the pre-gain, I'm not sure if you, if you, let's see if we save it as a, I'm gonna add number of audio tracks here and we'll adjust the pre-gain on all of these. So let me just come here to the mixer. Right, and we'll adjust the pre-gain. I'll select all the tracks here. Let's just set this to absolute. Let's set the pre-gain like so. Um, so if we wanted to save this as um, so default CPR file, so let's see if we save this as a template. We'll call it pre-gain start. Okay, and now as we come here, we'll close this project, we'll do a new project. And we could select our template, pre-gain start. We'll activate the project, come here and let's get to our mix console. And we can see that all the pre-gain values are set as they were set originally. So if you want to start a project with the pre-gain off, you could just have it start with a template. So let me know if that's what you mean. reading through more comments. Um, so I just see, could you talk about initial steps of using contact in Cubase? Thanks. Um, so I don't have a, a license of contact. Um, so um, so I'm, I'm probably not the best person to ask on that. Uh, I, I have one on my personal computer, but I don't have it on this computer. 
Uh, but it's really probably just starting off as, you know, adding instrument tracks. Uh, now contact is VST3 finally. So, uh, so that's helpful. But like, if I wanted to just come here and start off with Halion, you know, we could do this and everything that we just start loading up different sounds directly into VST instrument, but I don't have an instance of contact or to show really. So apologies for that. Okay, so just see a question. Um, Greg, your control room panel is so well featured with QSense, phones, multi monitors, reference, down mix presets, and mine is mostly blank. Can you show us how to pimp out your control room panel? So, a lot of times these will be uh, set by what is actually activated in the control room uh, audio connection. So, when we go to our audio connections, we click on control room. So, here I've added like, you know, talk back, microphone. So you just kind of right click. And as we add different monitors, uh, at this point, you know, these, whatever functions that we have that are set up in the control room and defined in the audio connections will then be reflected here. Uh, so sometimes people, um, you know, if you click on tabs, you could open and expand, you know, so if, you know, you'll see every control room will have down mix presets. I could switch between, uh, if I have multiple monitors, like in my studio, I have stereo and a 5.1, uh, monitor setup for my personal studio. So I have like monitor a is my 5.1 setup monitor B or monitor A is my larger stereo speakers. Then I have a 5.1 setup. I have monitor three is the left and right of my 5.1 speakers, so smaller speakers. And then I have just a center channel as a mono source and I could just kind of toggle back and forth. But a lot of it is, you know, as you kind of utilize, you know, different, you know, Q mixes, if you wanted to, if you have external devices. So right now I don't think I have an external device. So if I come to my audio connections and I right click and let's add an external. So let's say, okay, I want this to be coming from an iPad or, so now we'll see the external automatically gets added and we could switch between different external input sources as well. So once elements are defined in your audio connections window under the control room, then those become capable here. Uh, and one, one view that I like is when you click on the meter tab. So a lot of times I'd like to have my main meter tab, but I still want my big control room volume. If you have the meter tab, then click on CR. You can now see many of the control room functionalities and still see your meter right there. So that's a, a nice consolidated view within the main meter tab as well. Okay, so we just see um, about the question about the Curve EQ, just the chat didn't update. So they had a question about the EQ in the control room for EQing speakers and or headphones. Does it make sense or should I use as they are? The Curve EQ seems great for that use. So you could definitely EQ speakers in here in the control room. Uh, so if we click on the inserts tab, one thing that's really helpful is, you know, for each monitor, that we select, you know, we could have, again, up to eight different plugins on the monitors. But if we go to the main tab, and let's just click there to open that up, you know, here's where you could have, you know, plugins. And a lot of times when we do EQ in a control room, that's just through the monitoring path. And that's not going to be a part 
of the mix. So if we apply an EQ here, we could do kind of room correction stuff. And if you have a tool kind of maybe like sonar works, which can do like a room calibration of your setup at that point, we could, you know, have, have it inserted into the control room and our monitoring environment is uh, affected, but the mix isn't. So the idea is that we could correct the room and, you know, many people are kind of forced to put a room correction plugin on their master bus and, and always have to remember to bypass it when exporting the files. Otherwise, all of the EQ and room correction that the plugin is doing to adjust for the, for the deficiencies and uh, in your monitoring environment are then applied to the file, which is what a lot of people don't want. So that's why we could have processing in the control room versus processing in the master fader. But any EQ would work. If it sounds good, it's good. Okay, uh, so we see from Spike Williams, uh, greetings from Wales. What is the window for free upgrade from Cubase 11 to Cubase 12? I think it's from November 10th of 2021 until Cubase 12 is released. So, um, so if you haven't upgraded to Cubase 11 yet, um, you know, I would do it in a hurry. So to, to be able to take advantage of the grace period update. So... But if you had activated the license of Cubase 11 after November 10th, at that point, uh, you'll be eligible for the free grace period. So Steinberg, because uh, it was beyond the normal release schedule because of new licensing technologies being implemented, at that point, they, you know, for, to, for the benefit of the customer, decided to extend the grace period update. All right, so I see why automation assignment are still so awkward and antiquate. See Studio One or Bitwig, so I don't have licenses for those, but I don't think it's too bad to like, you know, as if you're going to automate a particular plugin. So let's say if I'm here and I wanted to automate, let's say the step filter and if I have my uh, plugin parameters, we could also just click on reveal parameter on right. So as soon as I go to write the automation for a particular parameter, I could now just automatically show that parameter. And now we could just edit. So, and a lot of the VST3 plugins, you could right click and just say, okay, I wanted to show base uh, resonance and automation track and just have it, <laughs> pop up right there. So seems pretty easy. All right, so we have a question. Um, says, I've been working with the chord track, but I don't think I've unlocked all the power. Can you please show some tips? Okay. Let's see if I have my project in my recent list. Yeah. Okay, so the chord track is um, very useful for, you know, a compositional standpoint. Um, so let's say if I have a drum loop and I'll just take this off record. And I could, you know, have my, uh, have it go directly out to an instrument. So I just wanted to drop some different chords in. So as I want to come here, say, okay, I want it to be an F chord 
and click on the plus sign and let's say to B flat and I want it to end let's say with the C seventh chord now the cool thing is if I just you know want to find a chord for this chord between B flat and C7 we could double click and go to the chord assistant here and as we go to the chord assistant we could look at a list and we could say okay I want it to be kind of common notes or based on cadence we could set different levels of complexity with the chords so we go to the chord assistant we could say okay maybe a G minor chord and we could also look at this based on musical proximity or based on circle of fifths so we could just kind of rotate the different results uh, once we have the chord track on our project if we wanted to make it maybe to a more guitar friendly key i could just drop it to like e from the key of f so now if i was writing for trumpets i would probably just put it in the key of f that's a little more friendly for them uh, but as i'm here if i wanted to drag these events to a track we can now just drag all the chord events two tracks and that will turn it and create MIDI data just that easily and if we want it to at this point now let's say switch different chord voicings um, just put this into you know I could say let's take this particular chord and if we wanted to switch you know chord voicings as well we could come to our chord track and we could say okay i wanted this to be more altered jazz chord voicings and we could choose i wanted these to be voicings for guitar We could also set up different voicings. So we could say, okay, I want five string triads, modern jazz chords. So we could switch between different chord voicings as we want to do this. Um, now, if I wanted to take an existing part and let's say at this point, I'll just take this and let's say we'll move on our playhead so now we could tell particular tracks to follow the chord track um, and this is helpful in a lot of ways so let's say I want to take all of these different tracks and we have them in a folder uh, I could tell when we get to the chord track setting here that we could tell these tracks to follow the chords or not to follow the chords so if I wanted to have drums, you know, and we could do this for monophonic audio, like bass or vocals as well. Um, but if I have like, you know, drums in MIDI, I may not want those to switch based on a chord. So if I wanted to come to, you know, different drum parts, I may not want those to follow chords. But now if I just want to try out different chord ideas, say okay let's do a G chord and now the parts that are set to follow the chord track and let's say with D with an F sharp in bass So lots of great stuff that you could do with the chord track. Now, one other thing that a lot of people miss is um, if we want it, let's say we're not like I'm a horrible keyboardist as everyone who's watched a live stream understands. It's not my instrument. I should practice, I know, but I just don't. Um, so if I have like a chord track, let's say I wanted to take the chords from this MIDI part um, we go to our project menu and I could just have the chords automatically created from MIDI data. So I could see my chord track here. Um, and let's say I have a string part. 
So I'll come here. And I'm going to just kind of hit the same chords and I'll do this from my computer keyboard so you, everyone could see. Um, so now I'm just gonna come here and I'll switch my octave here. So while this is playing, if I wanted it to automatically kind of play, I could take this string part and under the chord track, uh, we'll come and we could put this into live transform. So I will just say, let's make it automatically follow the chords. So while I'm playing here, so I'm going to just hit three notes here on my keyboard. And it's gonna look at the chord track and automatically remap the chords. So I play the same three notes, but then it's going to remap to fo automatically follow the chords from the chord track. So those are some like really cool things that you can do with the chord track uh, that, you know, a lot of people will miss. So it's a wonderful feature. So we see Mandy Lane just says, I need Cubase 12. Interesting. What new features will be? So. We'll have to wait until it's released, but I think people will be pretty cool. See, nice comment from Chris Hallam saying Anthony Hughes Dorco videos are some of the best instrumental instructional videos on the internet, honestly. So yeah, he does a wonderful job. I, I really enjoy watching his videos. Wonderful guy. All right. So we see Agent K was on top of some moderation. Thank you. We've been good for a couple months without any distractions. Gareth is saying, don't forget not to not to not hit the like button. You must be an English teacher or something. All right. Um, so we just see, is there a place to go learn Cubase from start to finish? Uh, I mean, in some kind of order. Um, so I'm sure that there's like, I think maybe Gru 3, you could check out, uh, you know, a wonderful series. You could check out is a man, I think it's a man and his song. Uh, Gareth may, uh, or I'm sorry, a jazz dude may share a link. Uh, but check out a man and his song. He did a wonderful series on, uh, Hallian, and I think he's done a wonderful series on kind of getting started with Cubase, so you could check those out. Um, but sometimes when you're doing a course like that, if you don't do you know MIDI stuff and you're doing audio, you could learn a bunch of stuff that's not applicable to your particular workflows. So some of the courses uh, could be tricky in that way, um, trying to 
figure out what your workflows are. Um, but there's a number of different, you know, so I would figure out like what you want to learn in Cubase and then maybe seek out tutorials for that on the Steinberg channel or within the Cubase Nation Discord. Yeah, and Jazz Dudes also just linked Jeff Gibbons tutorials. Yeah, One Man and His Songs. Those are wonderful as well. All right, so we see Gerald Ely just changed his name because I just totally butchered the pronunciations of it. So, um, so yeah, but it, was, it was great to see you on the Zoom meetup. So sorry about that. Now it makes sense. But you have to let me know if it's California or Canada, if if that's part of it. All right, so we see Sable Winters on the live stream. It's wonderful to see you on the Zoom meetup on Friday. Uh, so just see question, Greg, I would like to hear your thoughts, uh, slash techniques on gain staging, you know, so I, I try to keep it very simple with a lot of things, you know, so I, there's people, there are people that sometimes, you know, want to, um, you know, so it depends on the levels that were recorded, um, I'll take a look at uh, a gain stage. I'll just open up one of my friend Clay Ostwald's projects. Um, and he kind of does everything right with his stuff. So and Clay's an incredibly talented musician, engineer, producer, songwriter, everything has that right touch. So, you know, I try to keep it simple. So I know a lot of people go crazy with, you know, like I personally tend not to, you know, I see people adding 14 plugins on a track and, you know, and really doing very complex things, but I'll, I'll, I'll defer to take a look at what Clay has done. Like in this project is always probably a good, you know, so in Clay, does a masterful job on his productions of, you know, it's like, okay, it's recorded, you know, with, a, you know, it's not recorded super hot as we could see. So if we want to go to definition, you know, we want to look at the levels aren't super hot. Um, so as we're, you know, kind of just, and we look at the mix console, Nothing is super hot. There's not like, you know, so I see a lot of people fighting themselves with gain structure and kind of making mistakes uh, that way. So, you know, record it at a, at a decent level to start with so that you don't have to compromise and you don't have to try to make up for gain after the fact. So record with, you know, it doesn't have to be super hot. We don't, you know, it used to be that people, you know, had a mindset of record as hot as possible, like from analog tape days, because otherwise you're fighting the tape hiss, but that's not really the case anymore. So you could record kind of more dynamically um, as you work with it. So, you know, but a lot of people will record hot and then they're just kind of fighting the gain the whole way through the process, where if you kind of start off at a medium level and you don't have to try to compensate for it earlier or later in the mix or at different stages, I find that it kind of works a little better um, than, you know, sending it to like 14, you know, I, I've seen effects chain presets from people that are just, you know, it's like, do you need five compressors on a particular track? And it's like, oh, I use this for this one word and use that for this one note and use this for the low frequencies and this for the highs and everything is just kind of fighting itself. And if often I find if you bypass a whole huge chain, it doesn't make that big of a difference in context of a mix. 
So I personally tend to do things very simply uh, and don't try to make up gain artificially, but just kind of have a healthy gain through the input process, through the mixing process. And I find that that works well. Um, other people obviously have different workflows. So, okay. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, can I set a range selection in the marker window and have Cubase automatically set it and activate loop when I just click on it in the marker window? Um, okay, so let's let's just do a new pro or jump to a different project here. Jump back to our old reliable. Okay, so let's say if I want to, let's say in this marker view here, let me just, okay, so we have our marker track here. Um, Okay, so can I set a range in the marker window and have Cubase automatically set it and activate loop when I just click on it in the marker window? Um, so, you know, if we have this particular, so if we have, you know, loop enabled, so, and again, we have this preference set. So let me just come to the preference and it's under editing as we discussed before the uh, cycle follows range selection. So now if loop is enabled, I could just kind of, you know, play just that little part here. So let's say I just set my range follows selection. So I'll activate the preference again, cycle follows range selection. All right, and I'll just, let's see if I, split this out so we could see it a little easier. I'll just do it not in the divided track list. Okay, so now as soon as I select a particular range, um, and I think if you just hit, so let's say if I'm here, uh, let me see if I remember the key command. So let's say if I'm here, here and I hit so now that I have the range set okay so I'll just kind of set my range there and then I think you hit alt P so let's say, let's see if I have that set correctly, a preference, let me tie in here. Okay, so as I set a particular range, you know, one thing you do is if you hit Alt P, So it, as soon as we have that, we could hit Alt P and that will automatically play the range. Um, so let's say if we have a marker window here, so let's say I select the marker. Um, okay, so let's say, it, and now let's say we have our cycle markers, I assume. So let's say we set, add a cycle marker here, add a cycle marker here. And now if I wanted to play the particular range, so if I just, let's say we stop and then play, 
that we could just go to the particular range like that. Let me just reread the question and see if that makes sense. Um, so let's say while this is, and let's see if we could select this and have it Um, if we could have the loop automatically. So, so if we, you know, want it to, again, just kind of select, like, let's say on our folder here, you know, I could just kind of, so say with our range tool, You know, hit P, then one, you know, so there, there's some different techniques, but I, let's see if I could get it to, so let's say if I select the range tool here that we add. Okay, so let's say if I have this range tool selected, So if I select kind of the range and then hit the letter P, you could do that. So with that range, um, so if I wanted to make that into a macro, and let's see if I have this selected. Um, all right, well, I'll try making a macro here. Okay, so I'll add commands here. Okay, so let's say if I have different cycle markers here and I have one selected and I hit the left or right arrow keys. So we're doing this, let's say I want to go to that arrow key and then we could trigger the macro. Let's say A, play from cycle marker. And then I'll add a command to the macro. All right, so if I'm here, let's say if I select this marker and I could use the left and right arrow keys on my computer keyboard, I can now trigger this macro and if this works, we'll say, didn't take it, so you might have to hit one. So try, if you want to do that, try making a macro. Uh, and again, the macro that I just created was to, uh, let me just add, I'll try that one more function here. Sorry about that. So I tried transport locators to selection, transport cycle, uh, and then go to left locator. So if I'm here, I have that range selected. We go to our macros. And let's say I have this range selected. Let me just try running the macro again. And you could assign the macro to keyboard shortcut. All right, 
it's a thought that would say if it's not playing, let's see if the macro runs now. Sorry about that. I have too many macros. So at that point, you could just have it automatically go there. So again, you could try a macro like that and see if that will work for your particular scenario. Okay, so we just see Jazzy mentioning uh, Control Room exists since Cubase 4, 2007, when Cubase was $999, just to remember. So yeah, originally I think came in Nuendo 3.2, so. All right, so Michael Teams is saying, if you haven't hit the like button, shame, 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 whack. So we'll just assume people just haven't had it gotten gotten around to it yet, but. Um, all right, so just say, uh, hey, Greg, I wondered if you'd heard anything further on the customizable right-click menu. I'm still desperate for Steinberg to reinstate the original tools, top section of the right-click menu. So I, I, you know, I've, I've, you know, passed on a feature suggestion again. I'm going to start lobbying for it as well again. Um, but I think it's going to be what it is for a while. So, but I'll keep kind of, you know, fighting for that particular feature to get it back because I like the previous right click extended functions as well. So we see Michael Pierce's soup, soup suggestion for today is sweet corn and potato chowder with a hint of Indian spices. So sounds good. All right, and Michael Teams has granted me one gallon of Texas pecan ice cream for my family and myself. Thank you, it's very generous. Uh, greetings from Miami. Is it possible to have two different EQs for a single vocal track and used sequentially, uh, namely first verse EQ1 and second verse EQ2 using the automation? Thanks. Um, All right, so you know, one of the things that you could do if you want to do this is just say, I want to take, uh, um, all right, let's see if we could just automate effectively here. So let's open this up and we'll come over here to EQs. Okay, so let's do just an awful EQ for bass, but it's our EQ. And let's say as we're playing. So let's say I have that and I want to automate the EQ changes. So let's say if I come here. see if those EQs we look at will now be automated. All right, so let's say while we're playing here, I'll just I'll just zoom in so we can see our So we just saw the EQ change there, so one was automated. So let's say while we're automating again, I'll come here. So 
So you can see all those EQ changes have just been automated. So if you save it as a preset, that's an easy way. Another way that's pretty simple to do this on tracks is I will just come here and say, I want to take this track and we'll hit F7 and we could go to our studio EQ. So we'll go to plugins. So if I wanted to go to my studio EQ, I could say, okay, I want this particular section to be rendered with that EQ. And I want this section to be rendered with this EQ. So now we could just process um, and all those different functions could be, those EQs can be processed or just load them as presets and automate them uh, very easily. So you could go back and forth between like a verse and chorus with vocal sounds, but you know, it's very easy just to kind of select a range. And, you know, I want to go to my audio menu and just go to plugins and say, okay, I want to take this and I wanted to apply the EQ. We'll get to our studio EQ and I want that setting. And that setting will now just be applied to the selected range as well. And then you could always undo that processing afterwards. Okay, thanks for all the great questions. I just um, so I see uh, I bought WaveLab Pro. Since I bought WaveLab Pro 11, can I be eligible for the Cubase 12 new version grace period? No. So it's only going to be, you know, because. You know, if you have, if you just bought Cubase 11 with Integrate Spare, you could update to Cubase 12, uh, but you know, it doesn't do it for other programs. So it has to be the same program. Um, so just kind of makes sense. Let's see, Michael Teams uh, is just making a comment. I, I thought automation was pretty easy coming from a dinosaur here, so. Yeah, it's not bad. I used to have to do recalls on SSL G series computers. Um, so I just see, so is it possible, question, is it possible to create exactly the same function like the key command, close gaps, time stretch, but without stretching mode uh, via the project logical editor? So no, so I, I, I'm trying to figure out what you expect to be in the middle if there's no stretching. Um, so maybe Raphael, if you could, if you could tell me what you expect to be in the middle uh, between the what you expect to be in a gap if you want Cubase to, you know, have the audio from the from the other parts, um, you know, or nothing, or you know.
All right, just reading through comments. All right, so we have a question. Uh, what's the difference between linear mode or musical mode in a track? Thanks. All right, so when an event is set to linear mode, so let's say I come, I'll jump to a different project. Linear mode, it'll be the, the timing reference for the events on the timeline is gonna be based on time. In musical mode, it's gonna be based on the beat. So if we come here to a particular project, I'll activate this. So I'll just turn on this particular project. And let me activate, I'll just kind of drop in. So right now MIDI tracks usually default to musical mode. So if I have a particular pattern here and I put this pattern onto my timeline. Okay, I'll put it onto the right track. Okay, and we see my bars and beats uh, laid out for me here. So we have four measures of music. And when I come, let's say I add a roller track Uh, and I want this to be set to seconds. So right now we can see that we are um, slightly, we're at about 8.5 seconds. So now when this, when you notice these changes is when it's actually set to, um, like when we change tempos. So right now we're at 100 beats a minute. So if it's in musical mode, I change the tempo here. We'll notice that the bars and beats stay the same, but as I slow down the tempo, the time gets longer. Okay, so it's playing this. Now when I play it back, we'll say we were at 100 beats a minute. And I'll just take the change of cycle here. So now as I adjust the tempo down, so we're playing the same parts. It's still lasting four measures, but our time has changed. So right now we're taking about 12 and a half seconds. Uh, if I want to go back to 100 beats a minute, but if I switch this to linear mode, now when I adjust the tempo down, the files stay at the same time position, but play at different. So it's playing at the same time position, but playing at different beats. So that's the difference kind of between linear mode and musical mode. So musical mode, when you change it to tempo, the information stays at the beat. When it's in linear mode, in musical mode, it stays at the beat. When it's in linear mode, it stays at the same time position. All right, so just see a uh, quick question. Is there a way to unlink visibility of tracks in Arranger and channels in console when console is displayed in the lower zone? So I think it's gonna be a direct one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, so let's come over here. Let's say, uh, I'll just go back to our projects. We can see that maybe a little easier. Okay, so let's say we have all of our tracks here. Uh, so we see the colors. Um, so let's say if we go to our zones here. So I think that this will be kind of a direct, uh, so let's say if we hide 
or different tracks here that will reflect in the lower zone mixer since it's kind of on the same particular screen. So I think that those are linked, uh, whereas it's not necessarily linked in the um, in the standalone mix console views. So I think that's a direct relationship there. All right, um, so I just see when will Helix Native Line 6 company owned by Cubase and Yahama be able to be used in Windows 11 by Microsoft and Bill Gates? Um, so I, I could check, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Line 6 isn't owned by Cubase. You know, Yamaha owns, you know, both Steinberg and Line 6. Um, but I, I don't have Windows 11 in my system, but I could check to see if it, if I could check with some of my colleagues uh, to see if that's working. Um, so it may not, you know, a lot of plugins seem, I, I'm not sure if you've tried it and it doesn't work or cause most plugins that work in windows 10 work in windows 11, but it may not say it. Uh, but I haven't tried personally, but if you want to send me an email, I'd be happy to kind of follow up and see if I could find out. All right, we see from Gareth that he hopes we all had a fun Zoom up. So it would have been more fun if you were there, Gareth. So we hopefully we'll see you in March. Okay, so I see from Gerald Ely that uh, the CA was for California. So that's good. Okay, reading through some more questions. Okay, seeing some more Windows 10 and Windows 11 discussion, so. Okay, so I just see from Rob, uh, how do you get those green bars to, uh, in the articulation window that show where the note begins? Okay, so let's take a look. Goes on my Schubert piece here. Um, it could be if the events are set, you know, within the um, Let me just see if these are, so it could be that the particular lines here, so you see that the lines for the particular notes, um, it could be that the expression map, let me take a look at it just to we'll come over here to get the expression maps out of it. These might be set we go to violin one. So I thought maybe that if these were set to attribute or maybe it's because it's set to, let's see if I switch these to attribute or direction, if that makes a difference. So you could have articulations that will be for notes only or articulations that will be <clears throat> until 
It actually changes. It seems to show up automatically for me. I didn't. I don't think I did anything different to see the green lines in the notes. Let me just try from blank project here. and see if those rhythmic indicators work. So we'll just load up a bass clarinet preset here. Okay, and we'll come over here to the ex expressions. And I'll just import the key switches. Okay, so it's just entering some nonsensical data. So I'll just come here. I'll switch to the articulations and dynamics. We'll make this larger, taller so we can see. And let me just see if I... So as notes are entered in, it just seems to automatically put the little grid line in for me automatically. So let me know if that doesn't work for you, but it just seems to always show up on mine. Okay, just reading through comments. Thanks for all the great discussions. Seeing more information about Michael Teens's electrical surge that he had. All right, uh, so we see, uh, hi Greg, how to do a smooth accelerando or rollentando on all tracks of a project, uh, Cubase 11 Pro. All right, so let's say if we have uh, a number of tracks that are set into musical mode, you know, so once tracks are in musical mode, uh, so let's say I'll come to this project here because all audio and if it's MIDI, it's even just as easy. Same exact thing, but I want to, let's say we have 100 beats a minute and I want to just come directly to, we'll add our tempo track. 
All right, so I want to make sure that all the events are selected here, and or, or want to make sure all the events are in musical mode. So I'm going to place select musical mode there and for our audio or for, and we could also do it in our pool window so if we go to our pool window we could also activate musical mode there uh, when we go to our tempo track you have kind of two different functions here one is going to be step or ramp so if i just wanted to activate the tempo track we could do that and say okay i want to point there and i want it to do uh, to ramp up in tempo, so I'll just kind of select my pencil tool and say, okay, starting at this point, I want it to ramp, and I'll click here to a higher point, and now it's just going to ramp up, and all of my tracks will. So if I wanted to jump immediately down or jump to that point or now choose to ramp, or ramp down. So that's really kind of all you have to do. So once you place it into musical mode, you have the ability to just kind of ramp, but it's kind of hidden here. So maybe if you extended this out farther beyond what most people normally have by default. So just kind of click there and then you could choose between step, ramp, and automatic, which would kind of do the same value as the previous set. So give that a shot. Let me know if that helps. Uh, and one thing to worry about uh, with the tempo ramping is, you know, some virtual instruments, some samplers don't don't respond well to ramping. So, if you have a particular sampler, a popular sampler, and you do tempo changes and it doesn't work, it's that sampler. Right. We see Charles K join the live stream. Um, it's just says he hopes it's not too late, so so no problem. He says he has a question on loopback. So yeah, you know, if you haven't asked it already, I'm just kind of working. All right. So just seeing from uh, Chris Tazi. To uh, Jazz Dude, would it be possible to post the links to the content and channels you mentioned earlier in the comments section after the live stream? So the chat will also be available to reference as you kind of watch the live stream. So you could, um, so you can find it in the chat field as well. Okay, so we see from uh, Charles K just says, uh, just tried using loopback but not getting an audio into cubase everything looks fine in daw wondering if i'm doing something else wrong so generally the loopback is going to be like taking a microphone and your cubase and then transmitting that audio to another source such as like i use obs to transmit the audio and the video to the live stream here or to or if you set that up, you could have it utilized, be sent to Zoom or other kind of hosting programs. So it's not necessarily to get the audio into Cubase, but to take the loopback and take like the Windows sound drivers or the, um, you know, to the point where it's going to take your DAW with your microphone input and be able to transmit that out of the standard Windows driver when selected. So give that a try, Charles. Let me know.
Okay, so we see Charles K. sorted it out. All right, you see Michael Pierce is going to be taken off. So uh, get get a lot of rest and rest up and and get well soon and quickly. All right, uh, so I see question, will Cubase 12 have an update for the electric base app or is there an update in the works? Um, so the electric base is part, you know, is sold as a separate instrument or part of the absolute five collection. So it's not part of Cubase, um, but you know, and let me know if there's any particular updates that you would, any functionality that you're missing. It's pretty complete as is, uh, I'm speaking as a bass player. I mean, it has all the different pickup configurations whether you want like a P bass, a jazz bass, or two humbuckers, or stereo. So, you know, just has just about every pickup configuration that you would want. All right, Pablo has joined us from Galicia, España, and he's offering coffee for everyone, which he can't do until the end of the live stream. So, but great for you to be able to join us. And we have the whole hot mess contingent, in four, four, four out of four here. So, Thanks for joining us. And Gareth is so happy when Pablo joins. All right, so I think I'm at the end of the questions. We'll see if more are coming in. If not, we can wrap up a little early. Trying to get faster at answering my questions. Okay, so I see a question come in. Uh, could you go through the uh, control room settings, please? Okay, so when we want to work with the control room, and I, I appreciate the trophy that Agent K has provided. So, um, so let's go ahead and take a look. Um, so depending on what functions that you actually have uh, as part of the control room. So again, as we mentioned earlier in the live stream, we'll have, you know, kind of two different, um, you know, the functions that are, uh, you know, actually, you know, gonna be visible and accessible in the control room are, you know, going, are gonna be, you know, set up directly in our, um, you know, directly in the control room setup in the audio connections. So as we click here, um, and I'll just revert to this project quickly, or I'll bypass the tempo map. So, um, so we could see one is we're going to have our volume. So the concept is to decouple the monitoring volume from the gain structure of the master mix. That's kind of the first intention of the control room. So as I adjust the fader here, a lot of people end up using their master fader as their monitoring volume. And then if they have this down low because their speakers are cranked up, you know, they export and then they just lost 10 dB of gain doing this. Um, so this way we could have kind of a decoupled monitoring volume. And we could set, you know, the point where we could dim our volumes. And we could also set reference levels. So let's say this is the loudest that I want to mix. I could come right over here and hold down the Alt or Option key. Or Control or Command, I'm sorry. And now when I want to get to my loudest point in mixing, I'll just come here and I could go to like a known mixing reference level. Now, as I work with this, we could also have different down mix presets. So if I was working in 5.1 or stereo or mono, I could just say, okay, I'm listening to stereo. I want to do a mono down mix to check on it. Just come right here. 
Now, if we've configured multiple monitors, we can now select between, let's say I have Yamaha HS7s or JBLs or Genelex. I could just come here instead of having a piece of hardware that colors the signal, I could just have the monitor switch. And if I go to inserts here, what's interesting is uh, we could now have different volume levels for each of the monitors that we have set up. So if I wanted to just say, okay, let's go to uh, you know my different monitor sources here, and they're all different wattages, smaller, bigger speakers, we could attenuate the levels so that when we switch that they'll be identical. Now, the control room path also allows us to look at, so we'll go back to our main section here, but if I wanted to also just say, okay, I wanna take this particular event, you know, we could solo tracks and that mutes the other events, but we also have some handy things here where we could have a listen bus. So when we have the listen bus, if we click on the main, we could actually just determine that we could have the listen bus dim tracks. So we could do, so instead of soloing, I could just come right over here and hear this kind of more, so soloing mutes everything else, but the listen will just dim the particular tracks. So that, and we can set the dim level kind of right here. So if I want to hear that in context, and then we could do that kind of we could use it uh, after fader, listen mode, if we wanted to, so we could switch like kind of the monitoring position of that. So that's a handy thing. And if we have like two tracks that are being sent to reverb, so let's say I want to take these tracks and my guitars are feeding uh, a reverb. So let's say we'll do room works here. So let's say, okay, as we listen to this, a lot of times when we solo the reverb, the initial tracks also get soloed, but if I wanted to just listen to what's going on in the effect, I could just come right over here and just listen to only what's going on in the particular reverb channel. Now we could also have this set up with different cue mixes. So if we wanted to create cue mixes for our artist, we could go to the racks and activate cue sends. So at this point we could create uh, different headphone mixes for different musicians as well. And then we could control the headphone mixes uh, where we could have a talk back system. So if someone has headphones, and again, this is all using available inputs and outputs, that we could just grab our talk back and say, okay, you know, hey, do this take again. And we could communicate to different headphones. Uh, we could say, you know, the, the singer who has a sensitive condenser microphone, we don't want them to actually have the click track, but the other musicians, we want them to hear the click track in their headphones. So the control room will offer lots and lots of flexibility for, and I don't, I, think it's still fairly unique uh, in kind of a software world where we kind of take over what was kind of the middle part of the console uh, to, and if we wanted to listen to external inputs, so you could say, oh, I want to listen to my iPad or two track mix, we could, you know, off a two track. So we could just switch between external inputs and use as references as well. So lots of great stuff that we could do. All right, so lots of additional comments. Okay, so as you see, uh, I would like to create score with two separate lead lines that are rhythmically different. Uh, do I use layers so that I don't conflict? So let's go ahead and go back to uh, go to this project here.
Okay, so if I'm in, in the score editor, you know, so, you know, what you might want to do is, you know, it doesn't have to be on different layers, um, but, you know, so it's pretty easy to just say, okay, I want it to take, um, let's say I'll just put in uh, different eighth notes and we'll just come over here. I'll just put in, I'll just put in eighth notes here. And let me just switch my octave. And now if I just wanted to put in, you know, different voices, different rhythms, we could just come over here and say, okay, I want to put in half notes. So I'll just... Okay, so now I'll just put in half notes. So, but I think that if you wanted to um, deal with that a little more intelligently, what I would do if you're going to be doing different, uh, so when you go to the staff settings and you could just double click here, that you could have probably make sense to come over here and just go to polyphonic. And now we could have kind of like your two voices and then you could enter in on separate voices as we kind of just enter it in there. So that's something that you could, so check, try entering it into different voices and from the staff settings to polyphonic and choose poly, uh, for, the vo for the voicings. Okay, so I just see, can't we import PDF into the notation page? So uh, we can export PDFs, but importing PDFs, so, you know, Cubase isn't necessarily scanning. Uh, you know, it's not doing optical character recognition. I think most of the software companies that were doing that earlier have kind of moved away from it because of the, you know, unreliability of it. So uh, Cubase doesn't have the way of importing a PDF. So you can import MIDI files and, and music XML files into the score editor, but not a PDF. So a PDF can be exported. Okay, so we just see a uh, question. My studio PC is offline computer. Can I still use the dongle on C12, Cubase 12, or will I need to be connected to the net the whole time? for Cubase 12 to be activated and used. So all you need to do is to activate it once uh, and then you won't have to be online and it will not utilize the USB e-licensor. It's completely new technology under the hood. So you'll just do a one-time activation and um, at that point you'll, you won't have to ch check in every 30 days or anything like that. Once it's activated, it's activated. So just hook it up one time, do the activation, and you'll be all set. Are right, you seeing Jazz Dude mentioning uh, Best Screen Jesus did a great video on how to use a multi-button mouse to remote control Cubase? So yeah, so I saw that. That was wonderful. I think it was a Logitech mouse. All right, uh, so we see uh, basic score editor setup and functions. Thanks again, Greg. All right, so let's take a look. Um, So let me see if I have this project still on my list. All 
right, I'll just. All right, so, um, you know, a lot of times when working with score editor, uh, let's say, you know, it's pretty easy to have tracks that when we go to look at it in the score editor can uh, be looking like this. So maybe not the most ideal thing that you'd want to hand off to a particular musician. Uh, but there's things that we could do, and this is kind of typical for musicians that are, you know, actually playing the music and it's not programmed in. So when we look at it in a MIDI editor, for instance, we'll see that the notes are slightly ahead of the beat, but it's everything sounds really good, but it's just kind of like those little musical articulations and expressions with different rhythmic feels and grooves that often get kind of translated into this when we do uh, look at it in a notation editor. So if we double click here, we can go to our staff settings. Um, and if we go to, uh, let's say, we'll just come here to our staff and then I'm gonna just say main. So first thing I wanna do is just select kind of a key. So we can just go down for flats, up for sharps. They used to be the opposite in earlier versions, interestingly enough. Uh, and then I could do a display quantize. So I'm not actually going to move the position of the notes, but I say the smallest note I intended to play was an eighth note. But what it's gonna do is basically quantize the appearance of the particular note. So I say, let's go with this, and I want it the, the largest, rest, the smallest rest I intended was a quarter note rest. So a lot of times we may say, okay, I wanna have like a swing feel, let's consolidate. No overlaps. I want to go to my polyphonic voice here and then split and we could split at C3. So now when I hit apply, we can see that the music has been cleaned up significantly. So this is something very legible for musicians. So as we kind of work with different things, go to the staff settings and do a display quantize. Um, you know, and that will often, you know, do a tremendous amount of legibility cleaning up. So what was just this before, uh, and you could save all those settings as a preset could turn into that, that you could hand off to a musician very easily for them to read. So we see Jazz Dude has asked his son for a gaming mouse for his gaming mouse. So. All right, so Pablo is just mentioning he loves the control room. I guess room, so. All right, uh, so we see question. Uh, I tried to turn on auto fades in Cubase, but it doesn't seem to work as expected. I'm looking to be able to cut or split events and have them automatically fade in and fade on the edges. Is it possible? So what the auto fades is going to allow you to do is not necessarily for, um, don't think about it visually, but um, once the auto fades is turned on, um, so we, let's say I have this event here and I'm going to just split this particular event. So it doesn't necessarily move the fade handles, but what it does on playback, when we have auto fades activated, we could have an auto fade in and fade out. So we don't see it, but what it does is it just puts a 10 millisecond fade, uh, directly at the beginning and at the end of the events so that it plays back with the fade in and fade out, but it doesn't necessarily uh, render that fade and we don't see it visually represented. So 
if you want to see it visually represented, you could, you know, just select like 10 milliseconds and, you know, do a uh, hit a and do a fade to range. You know, if you wanted to select just a little bit of time. So if I come here, um, let's say if I do this, I could just hit a, and that will automatically do the fades to range if you want to see it. But the auto fades is just a playback parameter. So it'll probably get you to the same place sonically, maybe not visually, but if you make a cut, you could just kind of come and just select kind of before and after. And let's say you have the range tool and then you could just hit A and that will just do like fade in and fade outs very quickly like that if you want to see it visually. But the auto fades is just a playback parameter and not necessary and not necessarily an editing parameter that you would see visually. All right, so we see from uh, Stephen Butler, the thing that scared me about using control room is I seem to lose very audio functionality. Is that the case or just operator error? So there's a lot of things that, that go through very audio. So if we do a, you know, if we do very audio editing uh, on a particular track, so let's say if we come here, um, when we go to, if we don't have the control room active, so let's say, uh, I'll go to very audio here. And as we work on this, um, you know, we have the, uh, you know, we have the, uh, you know, the acoustic feedback. So now as I move notes, we hear that because that's actually being routed through, like when we scrub audio, that's actually being routed through the control room. So you should be able to, you know, like as I come here and I just want it to scrub, that all gets kind of routed directly into the control room. So most of the time, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, I, when I move the very audio, I can't hear it. And then it's, oh, you need to activate the control room. So, so you know, I would give it a shot if, you know, if that's why it was, if you weren't using the control room, um, you know, because of that reason, I think you're, you know, you should explore it again. Let's see, Pablo is saying we need more Q mixes. So I've been trying to get more Q mixes for a long time. So. Read through more comments here. Thanks for all the great. See, Gareth is trying to bribe to save up money to bribe the Grammys. So I'm in, I'm in the recording academy. So I, I get, I'll do some work next year. Or so for the hot mess CD.
And you see the uh, mouse that Best Screen Jesus did the video on was the Logitech G600. So thanks for sharing that, Jazz Dude. Okay, so we see, uh, is there a way to set up Cubase so that a MIDI controller pedal, i.e. Blackstar Live Logic, uh, can control functions to make Cubase like a looper? Um, so we had this question before. So we'll show kind of a, a looping technique that uh, someone was asking about for a long time. I don't have my uh, pedal hooked up into my controller now, but uh, to do this, you know, we could come up let's uh, just do a new project okay so let's say I have a number of tracks and I'll just add all right so I have all these tracks set up um, so we could have something called a generic remote so when we go to our generic remote, we go to studio setup and we'll see uh, generic remote. Um, and what you could have the generic remote do is like we could just choose to say, I'm going to take, and there's a MIDI learn function. So the, wherever you have the MIDI input for the Black Star foot pedal, wherever the, the MIDI is connected to the computer, set that for the input and output and hit the pedal then click on learn and you'll probably see that you know you'll have like fader one or fader two select that and you'll probably see the address switch to 64 meaning that this is a sustain pedal often you know when you connect it into the device whatever midi information that's transmitting so at this point we could say i want to go to trans you know and every time that we wanted to do this we could have cubase kind of in a uh and I'll, I'll just do this using a MIDI note here on my controller. So I'm going to use two different paddle, two different MIDI messages. So I'm going to click on learn. I hit this note. Okay, so this note is 96. And I want this to, uh, we'll go to punch. I will say, let's go to transport. And I just want to say device and we'll say record. Okay, so now, and I wanted the second note here. So we'll learn that note, and I want this to do command. I want this to, I think we could choose uh, navigate. And let's navigate down. So, so as I hit this key, it'll just navigate down and I could have a different key for navigate up. So let me just set a, another key here on. So we'll have, I'll just click on the learn. So this note, I want to navigate and we'll just select up. Okay, so I'm gonna put this into like a loop. Let's say I'll do a five measure loop. So let's say I want this to record. So let's say we're playing along and now I want to hit record. Uh, I'll just select and I'm, I'm just gonna switch my preference back. We may have toggled this previously earlier in the live stream, so I go to editing. Project and Mix Console will say enable record on selected audio track. So at this point, I'm going to hit the button and we'll have this track armed for record. So we'll record. So let's say I hit the foot switch again and now I want to punch in here. Okay, so we have this looping. So now I hit the next button, the, the next foot switch. I go to the next track and I could punch in with my foot switch and I go to the next track. I want to go down here, punch in, 
Okay, I want to go up different tracks. Okay, let's punch in here. So these tracks are continuing to play back, but we could just, you know, add tracks, you know, set record enable, and you could kind of create a looping environment just using those particular functions uh, with the foot control with generic remote. So whatever it's connected to into your MIDI interface, define the ports, learn the functions, and then assign each of those buttons or switches to particular functions in Cubase. And then you could do kind of live looping type of functions. Um, so I see from JVI just mentioning, um, uh, so has anyone done an elaborate tutorial on Pad Shop 2 like the one, like one man did for Retrolog? So check out uh, Gary Gibbons has a whole series. And I think a bunch of them are on the Steinberg YouTube channel. So look in, I think if you go to uh, youtube.com slash VST Instruments, I think is what it's called. Uh, but look at Gary Gibbons tutorials. He's a genius with Pad Shop. Um, so, and he also has the online music foundry and does like wonderful presets, but check out all of his uh, videos. I'm sure they're probably in the, in the uh, Cubase Nation Discord as well. Yeah, and there's also uh, there's also a great as Jazz dude mentioned from uh, Simon Stauckhausen uh, on uh, so on Pad Shop tutorials as well. Just all right, so just see um, on the looping, so generic remote is a way to go. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Great. So I see Nick has granted me with a cup of coffee for, uh, for uh, for my time stamping hours for all for doing creating the indexes afterwards. So I appreciate it, Nick. I'll, I usually try to make a mocha just to make it less painful. So. All right. So with that, I think we reached the end of the questions again. So we have a couple minutes left. Uh, we'll see if there's any others, any other quick questions that come in. So once again, we'll be doing our live stream on Friday. So we'll be starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. If you have questions that you want covered, you could please send those in to uh, Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. Um, and we'll see if there's any other questions that kind of sneak in. If not, we'll wrap up maybe about 10 minutes early. I want to thank everyone for all the wonderful questions. I hope that everyone has learned a new tip or trick. And if you have, please feel free to hit the like button. And we'll wait just in our moment. If not, uh, 
We want everyone to please stay safe and healthy. And, um, and with different developments in Europe, we hope everyone is safe as well. So with that, I guess we will go ahead and wrap up. I know there's often a delay when I talk, so I'll wait just a little bit, see if there's any last minute questions that come up. Okay, so I think we are good. So thank you so much. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing everyone on Friday. Uh, everyone, please, again, stay safe and healthy. Wow, 148 likes. It's fantastic. I appreciate it. All right, we'll see everyone on Friday. Take care. And check the Steinberg website soon.